Hey, sweltering strangers. Welcome to another episode of The Strange Sessions. I'm Krista. With me is Kurt, and we're going to talk for like the next 20 minutes on how hot and humid it is. Oh, my it. God. <laughs> so bad. As Krista knows, I complained that I barely slept last night because my air conditioner is broke. Mm. And I've been cleaning my, cleaning my apartment so that it looks like halfway presentable for when they come up to look at oh, it. Oh, sure, sure. So I'm like, I'm going to tell them Thursday because I knew it was supposed to be warm this weekend. And I'm like, I'm going to tell them Thursday. So I went down to the office Thursday. They are on vacation now until uh, Monday. Uh, so It's supposed to be hot all week, too, I, know, I think. I know. Well, it, I looked and it wasn't like... Su- in Manitowoc, it's not super hot. Mm. I think... I don't even see... I think one day it might, it's supposed to hit 80, maybe. So it's not going to be super hot. Oh, that's hot. not bad. No. It's supposed to be upper 80s. But last night, here. it was so hot in my apartment, I could not sleep. So I only got like a few hours of mm. sleep. I'm having issues with one of my teeth that I think might break soon, and I'm I have no money whatsoever. I'm I've been, you know, like I literally have been living on like outdated hot dogs that are marked down that I buy from the store. So I've been uh, living very frugally. frugally, but I can't afford to go to the dentist because I have no money. Uh, so I told Kurt so he eating, can use our podcast. I might money have to dip into the to. podcast money money if I have to because if this tooth breaks, I'm going to be screwed. Yeah, you have so to I'm going to have to go to the dentist. But I've been eating all soft stuff, and even like now, potato chips are getting like I'm worried about eating oh, potato no. chips. That's the worst. So, yeah, it's it's been it's been a suck storm in my life a lately. But thank you for like listeners that are my friends that have sent me like gift cards because I've been living off a lot of that stuff. It's so crazy! So Imagine thanks, what guys. you would do if we didn't have this podcast. Uh, oh, I know. I know. Uh, so, yeah. it's just, Well, I would help you. Well, thanks. It's been Suckville lately. So this episode, I feel like, is because uh, I haven't been in the uh, best frame of mind lately. Uh, and my sleep stuff is still just so screwy. Like, mm. I'm trying to stay up till like 8, <gasps> 8.30. What? But then I'm still up That's super crazy. early. Yeah, you got to get... It's, it takes a while to change your pattern. I've yeah. noticed that. Yeah. Because I, I used to... I would only go to I would go to bed at eight, but I wouldn't I would read until nine and I was waking up at three, four in the morning and I finally have sort of retrained. I'm still going to bed at the same time. Yeah, I'm finally able to sleep until like five now, though. And even though even though it's a this is kind of a spoiler for the next episode, but I was with Aaron yesterday Mm -hmm. doing various things that you'll hear about in the next episode. But even he was so, like so cryptic. He, he even noticed. He said like once like it got to be like around two o'clock. He said he noticed like a complete change in me. Like it hit me, and all of a sudden I was super, super tired. Super tired, yeah. And he's like, he's like, yeah, you were up at like one thirty. Probably the morning, doesn't help so. that you're living on hot dogs. No, <laughs> you need some actual. I, I do sustenance. take vitamins. I do take vitamins. Yeah, you need like real protein and. Not I, that hot dogs aren't protein, but hot dogs are not good. For I you. don't know if it's. I don't know. Yeah, hot dogs are. The less I know about hot They're dogs, a meat the better. Product. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it's been sweltering hot. Yeah, it's hot. I was just dying last night in my apartment. I couldn't sleep. I had a fan blowing on me. We so. were just talking like a week ago about, oh, it's hot, but it's not humid yet. And now it's just, I don't yeah. know where it came from, but it yeah. is humid. Yeah, so it's At been, least the smoke from Canada finally cleared up for us. It's been, it's been crazy here. Uh, do you want to jump into what they can do if they don't want to listen to us? Oh, yeah, you want to listen to us? Eating outdated hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to listen to that? Uh, you can hit pause and check the show notes. Kurt will actually post the timestamp of when the topic starts if you don't want to listen to this because we still got to get through a taste test, welcoming nope. new strangers like you're in for a ride. It's funny because I was listening on the way down here, the Sof- an old episode of the Sofa King podcast, and they went off on this weird tangent about, I don't. it was like disturbing whatever it was, <laughs> and one of the guys says, you realize if we had any first time listeners, they're gone by now. <laughs> they're out. <laughs> yeah, they, they dipped out. <laughs> Oh, uh, shout outs to our newest stranger. We've only had one. And that is Paul Lee Butler. So thank you so okay. much, Paul, for joining. Oh, yeah. I remember that. When shout out to all to my me. students that are listening. Cause I love you guys and I dearly miss you guys. Um, housekeeping. Uh, one of the things that I was surprised to learn from Nicole was that Stitcher is going. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Under or not we have under, a lot but they're of just changing Stitcher it. listeners. Yeah. So Stitcher, they're, they're doing away with Stitcher, which is So weird. you won't be able to listen to podcasts through it anymore? You have to, it, it's part of Sirius XM or whatever the thing you have to pay for. Oh. And then I think you could do it. I don't know. I was trying to read it and it's just like. Well, if you're listening right now through Stitcher, be prepared. But there are a lot of other free podcasting platforms yeah. that we're available. Well, we're through, I think we're available through all platforms. Yeah. So And we're on Podbean and we love Podbean. We love so Podbean, Podbean yeah. I know, has an app where you can listen to stuff. Yeah. 
We're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts, obviously. That's the only so. real housekeeping I had. was <laughs> just that Stitcher is going. I'm glad by. you. I totally forgot that you had mentioned that. So yep, yep. I'm glad you brought it up. I feel like there's something else that we were like, we got to mention that. I don't remember what it is now. To me, that was it. So okay. that was the one thing I was worried about forgetting. Okay. Uh, should we dig into this box and see what kind of taste test we have? Let's dig into a taste test. Make okay. it a soft one we're so I don't break my tooth. <laughs> no taffy. Yeah, we'll save it for the book one. Um, Corey said that I guess my cousin and her kids got us some taste test stuff that's at his house for us to pick up for next time. But Aaron's coming on next time, and there's one specific item that was sent to us that we want to try when Aaron comes on. Yeah, that does. These are pretty. Those are pretty. It's Boston. Hold on. Boston fruit slices. America's original fruit slices. Fruit flavored slices. (laughs) Those, those <laughs> I just do. said the same thing like five times. <laughs> so it's basically look they look like um, just like a chewy fruit. Yeah, fruit. Okay. Wow, I'm really bad at describing stuff right now. Okay, let me. I'm gonna go under a light so I can take a picture. Yeah, and, and I'm running on like two and a half hours of sleep, so my babbling might not be very coherent either today. Um. I There's probably so much noise of me like bumping my microphone. I'm sure, and... I'm sure there is because I don't edit these anymore. Good. Whatever, whatever we record is what you guys get. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and some people are paying for this. Oh, let's see. <sighs> Actually, let's plug our coffee page for a second. Yeah. Just thank you to everybody who supports yeah. us there. You guys have no idea how much that means to us that yeah. you guys paid a. And I think Krista wants to throw a, like our show notes yeah. in there too. I'm going to start posting coffee. our show notes yeah. to our subscribers so they can, maybe they'd like to read through your research. I think that's kind of a fun idea. Yeah. They're <clears> very, <throat> they're very, they're very poorly spelled because I just use the old basic, basic notepad. Yeah. So there's no like, so there's no autocorrect. <laughs> so they're going to look like hot messes, but um, so if that's you're our podcast in a nutshell, hot I, for, messes. I forget yeah, exactly a dumpster fire. I forget what the, I have three levels of membership. The first one I think is simply strange. And that one you just get like today we're recording Saturday. Those folks and everybody above will get this episode today. You get it a day yeah. early and yep. it's unedited. Yep. And then you get any weird extra stuff that we happen to post, which isn't a lot, which is why I want to start adding the show notes. The second tier, I think, is... Crap, what do I have them named? There's Simply Strange, Super Strange... Sort of Strange? No. Uh, If you go to the coffee website, and we have it posted on our Strangers page and I believe on our Instagram, but there's three tiers. The second tier, you get the same thing as the first tier, plus you get a side session every month. And then if you do that, I think that's $5. The lowest tier is three. The second tier, I think, is five. Wow, I almost know what I'm talking about. The third tier is um, $10 a month, and you get two side sessions per month, plus the unedited episode and anything else in the lower tier. So mm-hmm. trying to find more things to include to people who are actually paying for this. Yeah, because we always feel like we don't give you guys enough I for there, what you do for us. There might be people who pay who don't even look at the content. Like, they just want to give us money, <sighs> which I think is insane. I think we need to visit them and hug them and yeah. take them out for breakfast. Ooh, breakfast. That sounds good. Breakfast always sounds okay, good. Okay, so do you want... Ooh, there's like Give me a, the lime. I'm, I'm looking at the lime. The lime? Yep. There's a watermelon one. It, yeah. like, actually looks like watermelon. And then there's lemon, I think. And maybe this might be grapefruit or orange. Ooh, I bet there's grapefruit and orange. Thank you. I don't know what it was, but do you want me to take a picture or do you want yeah. to? I'm going to grab I'm going to grab what I think might be grapefruit because I think the orange is probably orange. <laughs> Go figure. Oh. Hold touch, on. I touched mine to my tongue already. Well, dang it. It's very dark. I'm not here. getting a lot of smell. No. It's very not subtle. Really. Okay, ready? Yep. Mm. Okay, that's good. Mm. That's like, mm. Mm. Hmm. that's really good. It's there's delicious, a candy. But there's a candy that it's like. Yeah, it doesn't taste like the fruit though. Mm. It's really sweet. Wow. It's very. It's weird because I just brushed my teeth. <laughs> it's really good. And the the part that's supposed to be the rind is a it's little harder. like harder. It's a little harder, which is cool. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I'm gonna give it a nine. I like the sugar coating on the outside. Mm-hmm. 
I'm going to give it a nine. I don't think it tastes like grapefruit, though, or orange. I don't think lime tastes like a lime. It doesn't taste like lime. So mm-hmm. maybe they all have the same flavor. Just They're fruity. just different colored yeah. to look cute. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give mine a nine. I'm going to give mine a nine, too, just because it doesn't taste like what I think it was going to taste like. But it's good. Mm-hmm. I like this. Mm-hmm. Nine and a half. I'm bumping mine up to a half. Ooh, have we ever done a half before? I don't know if we did or not, but I'm doing it. It's our podcast. We can do it if we want. I like that the rind part is harder. Mm-hmm. I do, too. Mm. Okay. Do you want to take this home? Actually, I might because those it, are really good. <laughs> it will not get eaten here. No, I'll take that home. Because Jim won't eat these and I, I'm not a... Candy. Sweet. Everyone Thank you. Thank you. That was from Tiana, right? Uh, it's in this big box, so yes. Is that from Tiana? or No, that's from... That is from... Um, We're done with Tiana's box. Yes, that is from Michaela. Yes, it is. Oh, Michaela, thank you so much. There's more stuff in here. I'm actually going to have another one. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you, Michaela. You guys are so awesome. Mm. Okay, what next? Is there anything else? I don't think so. Do we have any other... Thing, anything else to open or no? I don't think so. Okay. What time are we looking at? This is like early. 19. Yeah, oh. we're actually ahead of schedule because we did almost t- eight minutes, eight, nine minutes of banter. That'll be in the unedited version. I un-edited. have such a problem <laughs> saying that. Unedited. <laughs> well, talk Ooh. about something else until I get this one eaten. Oh, okay. Um, Whenever you put me on the spot. Oh, I have postcards to read. Ah! I'm <laughs> terrible at this. So Tiana had sent us. That was a very Wisconsin. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Tiana had sent us some postcards, and I think I read. One of them. One of them. So there's two more. These are from January. I'm going to read them in order. I'm going to take pictures. She went on like a haunted tour. I know. I was super jealous. She was sending me pictures while she was on it. And that's where all of our like yeah. care packages. Yeah, stuff she was came texting from. me pictures while she was on it. I was super jealous because they're Area 51. All these awesome places. <clears throat> so this one says, Earthlings Welcome, Little Ailey Inn in mm-hmm. Rachel, Nevada. January 18th. There was a whole day on my road trip that was full of random paranormal things. It started with randomly driving past the Clown Motel. I was seriously did so she, excited. Did you read this one already because we talked about the Clown Are Motel? Are you sure? I don't know. Then stopped at the Little Ailey Inn before I driving down the road. I think you read this one already. I don't remember reading it, but that doesn't mean anything. I remember the Clown Museum. I remember you talking, you mentioning that. So uh, Well, shoot. Okay, let me read this one. Okay. Let's see. It's the Minnesota Iceman <laughs> Museum of the Weird. Dang. What are we doing wrong that we don't get to go to all these places, but everybody else does? Well, we could. We have the money to do That's it. That's true. We're just lazy. And we could do episodes about this stuff. Yes, the true. This museum was amazing. This is from January 22nd. So many things I already know about because of you two. Aww. I'm skeptical of the Iceman, though. Do you know about this one? No. They actually, quote unquote, had him on ice. So you better believe I was right up to the glass with my phone flashlight to investigate. <laughs> Perhaps this could be a mini mystery. Tiana. Hmm. No, I've never I've heard, never of, heard that. of that. I've never heard of that. We have to do a Strange States Minnesota, though. So that might oh, be yeah. a cryptid that we talk about in when we do Minnesota. Cool. Minnesota. We should do that soon, I feel like. Too bad Sophie and Adam couldn't join us for that one. Oh, maybe. I want to get together with them, but the summer is just flying by already. I know. I know. Uh, it's July 1st, I know. people. Sorry, I know. that was very aggressive. I just maybe, can't believe Maybe it's we'll July save 1st. Minnesota until like, we can hook up with them. That would be fun. Yep. I love Minnesota. I really do. Like, I wish I went to Minnesota more often. I've only been there a couple times, but it feels very much like Wisconsin. So it, it feels is. like home. It's very much like Wisconsin. Um, anything else? Nope. What are we talking about today? Do you know? Missing 411 Spotlight. That's another Missing 411 Woo-hoo! Spotlight. Good job on remembering that. <laughs> I can remember some things. And the first, we're talking about two different cases. Uh, the second one is going to be basically me just reading. A lot of me reading, but that's all I could find for a deep dive. Okay. But it's a... It's Do you a, take these from the books? I, I've looked at their sections in the books, but I picked them at random. The first one I picked, the second one I picked is because that always shows up in the most in the most bizarre missing four on one stories. Ooh. So we've I never wanted, talked about it. We've talked about it. Okay. But but I wanted I wanted to do a deep dive on okay. it as much as I could because it's it, it's involves a John Doe, so we don't know really who it is. Okay. But I wanted to do a deep dive as much as I could, and it turns out I will talk about that when I get to the second one. But the first one I'm doing because uh, I when I originally started last season doing a missing four one one episode, 
it I was I stumbled across this and it said it took place in Horicon. And I'm like, ooh, Horicon's in Wisconsin. Turns out it was in New York. Oh. <laughs> so I was like, poop. So I put it on the back burner. But then again, this this popped up again somewhere else. So I wanted to do it. But I also want to say that if you have never seen Missing 411, The Hunted, it's so good. go watch it before this one, because it's going to help a lot with the first one I'm going to be talking about today, actually. And I'm pretty sure it's on YouTube. I, I watched it on Tubi. Oh, I think it's on Prime as well. If you don't have Tubi, get Tubi. Yeah, it's I mean, free. my God, Tubi is amazing. Tubi, I can live on Tubi and Pluto TV. Mm-hmm. Those are the two things that I completely live on. They're both free. Yeah. Like I said, Pluto TV has a 24-7... Uh, old 80s 90s unsolved mysteries channel nice. that's nothing but old episodes of unsolved it has mystery science theater 24 7 uh i watch bar rescue a lot on there actually which hmm. is weird because i love the show bar rescue yeah. which you would never think no. that that's my thing but i love that but i love that but tubi has so many good free movies and tv shows and stuff so terrible found footage films ter- <laughs> but it's some good found footage so, films. yeah isn't that where we watched um leaving dc watch yeah leaving dc was on there uh but get tubi and if you've never seen missing four when one the hunted watch it yeah, go watch good. it right now and then come back Stop, press pause go watch it immediately there wasn't it good because uh, <laughs> the the first one they talk about in in the hunted missing four one the hunted is the case of tom messick which is what we're going to be talking about today okay because this is one of the more popular i don't want to say popular but it's more well known i guess is it fe- and it's featured in that one and it's the very first one featured in that one okay and what helps is their map of where they mm. were when they were hunting and where the other people were and that helped immensely to see that map mm-hmm. so i'm taking this first part from the strange outdoors.com website which i go to a lot for these kind of mysteries it's from december 4th 2019 called the very strange disappearance of Tom Messick whilst hunting near Brant Lake. On October, October, I already screwed it up. It's November. No, October. <laughs> I don't know why I was Spoiler thinking October. alert. Uh, you've probably heard about this case, though. I'm sure. Oh, I watched that documentary, so. Yeah, but there's, like, I don't know about this one. There's When I was driving down here today, I was listening to another podcast. I listened to two podcasts, and I listened to one about Tom Messick and they kind of believe the theory that I believe the least. Hmm. But it was listening to them, I'm like, maybe. But we'll get into that. I'm jumping the gun here. You curtain yourself? On November 15th, 2015, Thomas Messick Sr., aged 82. So, I mean, he's old. He's missing an eye. And right away, you're going to think, okay, you have a really old dude in the woods missing an eye. Super easy for him. Something bad's going to happen. But he's also an ex-paratrooper. He was a a survival. He taught survival courses. He taught hunter safety. Hmm. So, I mean, this guy knew his stuff. Uh, But he was 82 years old. An ex-paratrooper walked into the woods south of Brant Lake in New York State to hunt for deer and was never seen again. No sign of him or his belongings ever turned up, including a rifle and walkie-talkie, despite a large search of the area. In this this becomes a thing that a lot of people are suspicious about. Unusually, the FBI was even involved in the investigation. This is a strange and puzzling hunting disappearance. Yeah, I remember that piece yeah. of it. Okay. Tom served in the U.S. Army as a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne Division, and he was 5 feet 10 inches tall and weighed approximately 160 pounds. He was an experienced hunter and woodsman and taught hunter and survival training for many years. I mean, he... he If there's anybody that shouldn't get lost in the woods or whatever, it's him. He had a history of heart problems and lost an eye in an accident with an explosive device in his early 20s, so he had poor vision and limited hearing as well as 159 stitches in his hand. But, you know, so he's pretty... That happened decades ago, Yeah, so he's used to to living without that eye. He's adapted to that. He also had just gotten over a case of shingles and nearly decided not to go on the annual hunting trip. I had shingles a couple years ago. Yeah, my chest. Super painful. It sucked. It sucked. I've never had it. It sucked. Yeah. Um, It was bad. It was just, it wasn't, it was, it was hard to explain because it was like, it didn't hurt all the time, but if I would turn my torso like a certain Mm. way, it would just burn. It burned. Yeah. Yeah, It was, you know, like this is the most, disgusting way i can think of to describe it but it was like having a huge cold sore oh, on my chest yeah and it was it sucked because it, it so kind bad. of gets like yes. scabby yes. right yeah. yeah so that was not a great time in the life of kurt yeah. 
Tom lived in the city of Troy in New York State and was out that Sunday with a group of six friends and family members who were hunting near Lily Pond in an area of state land that is part of the Lake George Wild Forest. After 55 years of hunting with longtime friends, also senior men, at the Messick hunting camp in Haig, they decided to try this area for the first time. Some of the stuff I read said there were seven people. Some of the stuff I read said there were six people. Fun. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple discrepancies. <laughs> yeah. And uh, an interesting thing is that a lot of the like sites I went to to research this said uh, the men knew this area because they've hunted this area their whole life. But other ones said they didn't. This was their first time hunting in this area. And I do That's believe frustrating. I do believe it was their first time hunting in this specific area. They were they were familiar. What did with the documentary the, say? Because they interviewed. I think the people, documentary right? said, "Yeah, I think the documentary said it was their first time." Okay. They they're used to that area, but not. I mean, specific. not that specific area. Okay. Thomas was tasked with sitting stationary during a drive by his fellow hunters. Three other older members of the group were also sitting stationary in a line formation with less than 100 yards between them. The younger members of the group went down a nearby trail and swung down around towards the line of older men trying to drive the deer towards the stationary members. And this is where... The documentary does a really good job of showing you on the map, the map. of where the people are stationed. Yeah. And a lot I of kind people, of vaguely remember a that. lot of people say it's a stupid thing to do because if you you're all sitting here and you are you the younger guys are over here pushing the wildlife towards you, you could easily shoot one of the the younger guys that are coming through the woods with the animals. Mm -hmm. But I I know people that do this method yeah. of hunting and some people say it's dumb, some people say it's not. Hmm. But I don't know enough about it to judge. I don't, I don't either. Uh, Coleman, I know, hunts, so Coleman might know about that. But I, I used to work... I know with, somebody who was shot when they were hunting. Well, I used, to, I used to work with a guy that said that their way of doing it was they would all go in a big circle and then gradually enclose, mm. in, and whatever was in the middle of that circle would get shot, but then you're in a circle shooting, mm -hmm. you know? Let's, we're always like, is that a really good idea to hunt yeah. like that? But So I don't know. But again, the documentary does a good job of mapping, showing where they were. all these people were sitting. After failing to see a single deer, the group convened, but Thomas was nowhere to be found. It was worth noting that the entire group, including Thomas, each had a working walkie-talkie. Thomas never said a single thing on his walkie-talkie that day, though. In addition to the walkie-talkie, he was carrying a rifle. When he didn't come back, the group yelled, fired shots, and searched the area. Thomas's watcher location was only a couple hundred yards away from the parking lot, and the group stayed at the truck overnight hoping that Thomas would show up, honking the horn continuously and yelling into the night. He was last seen at 10 a.m. That's when they got out there to hunt was around 10 a.m., and I guess around like 2 or 3 in the afternoon they called it off because they just weren't seeing anything. So he was last seen at 10 a.m. 2 or 3 a.m.? No. P.m. Did I say a.m.? No, I'm just saying they... He was last oh, seen they at called ten. Off the hunting yeah, because they didn't two. get out there to start hunting until ten a.m. Okay. So then that's when they all went to their positions where they sit. I thought you meant they stopped searching for him at two to three p.m. And I was like, what? No. Uh, <laughs> no. They but stopped hunting. At yeah. 2 to he 3 he got to his location where he sits, and they drive the yeah. animals towards him at ten a.m. And when he when he did not show up at the agreed upon time, his friends called the forest rangers, and they searched from four thirty p.m. on. Okay. It got dark around seven p.m., and at that point, half the group stayed and fired their rifles and honked the car horns to attract Tom back to the area. The rest of the men left the scene and reported him missing to family and the authorities. It's so odd that he would wander off, though. His job yeah. was to be stationary. Yep. He was wearing duck boots, camouflage pants, and coat, gloves, and a red and black checkered hat that he'd worn for many years, and carrying a rifle and a walkie-talkie. And I guess a snack. He looked like Elmer Fudd. Yeah, that's what, kind of what it sounds like. <laughs> and I guess he had a, he had a rifle and a walkie-talkie and a snack that he had brought with him. Okay. The day after Tom disappeared on November 16th, the search started with 13 trained search and rescue professionals from the Park Service. It was well organized from the start. A huge search over several weeks involving more than 300 professionals and volunteers on some days, assisted by dogs, divers, and several helicopters, found no clues, including no sign of his rifle or walkie-talkie. More than four square miles were searched, with a larger area being searched by air, with the aid of a helicopter from the state police aviation unit that had the FLIR, that had the, like, the, the, the infrared or night vision or whatever you call it. So, I mean, they had, and, and the... 
documentary does a good job of showing how well this search and rescue was done. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we've talked about other ones where just all totally of a sudden... Totally botched. Yeah, well, no, not botched, but it's like everybody shows up, like the local quilting club shows up to help <laughs> look, and then you got people walking through the woods... Contaminating. Contaminating like, yeah. stuff. Like this one, the documentary Very showed... Organized. Like did a really good job of showing how they did this thing where like 20 people would walk straight... In a line, yeah. And then they would rope off one side, and then they would flip around and then do the other side. So it was like really thorough. This was like... I've I've seen like recreations and read a lot about the search and rescue situations in these missing four one one and this one like I think was one of the most well run of these mm-hmm. search you know situations. More than fifteen agencies were involved, including DEC DEC I don't know what that is Forest Rangers, police canine units, police officers, an FBI quick response team, a state police special operations response team the Warren County Sheriff's Office tactical team and volunteers from the New York State Federation of Search and Rescue Teams. So that's a good group of people. Mm -hmm. But what a lot of people have an issue with is the FBI. Yeah, why would they show up? This shows up in a lot of our missing 411 when the FBI shows up. And I really, really need at some point to get a better grasp on if the FBI will show up to help with a search for somebody or if they don't absolutely don't i would say it's only in certain situations like you like if somebody is kidnapped and they cross a state line yeah fbi gets involved yeah like there's really specific there's a couple scenarios. theories there's a couple theories well, let me get to the theories why people think the fbi might have been involved okay but i just i don't know i if like if what i, I don't know if there's a moth or something oh you heard something about. no i saw something fly oh. by. uh i just don't know like if you're with the fbi and you're nearby and you're not doing anything it's like go help these people but a lot mm-hmm. of people say like a lot of people like say that. it's fishy that the fbi was there it seems odd to me yeah there's, there's a to lot be a of certain people circumstance. i was reading a lot of people's comments that they think the fbi knows that there is something to this missing 411 mm. stuff so anytime there's a case like this that seems off that mm-hmm. they investigate and they're basically in the same position we are where Trying they don't know what's, what's happening on. too but they just won't share that with us yeah. i don't know if i buy that i don't know it is weird yeah. that they were involved yeah so it is weird and when you watch the doc i think it was in the documentary but thomas's wife who they talked to they were married for 56 years said quote the FBI told me something isn't right with this case, but they don't know what. They won't share any theories if they have them. The FBI said until they make some kind of discovery, they're never going to know. So that almost leads to the idea that the FBI is trying to figure out what's going on with these disappearances in the mm-hmm. woods. But people say that maybe it, it wasn't the FBI she talked to and that she was mixing them up with like a local s- police unit. I feel like the FBI is pretty deliberate about sh- I'm saying with I'm the, the FBI, FBI. <laughs> showing their badge and you stuff. Jackets. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, her quote about that lends believability that the yeah. FBI is trying to figure out what's going on with these strange disappearances, too. But I don't know. The weather quickly turned poor with heavy rain, but sniffer dogs were deployed before the worst of the rain arrived. Searchers walked through the woods, no matter how thick they were, including swamps, and checked nearby roads, but there was absolutely nothing. Areas were tied off with string to box off specific areas to allow a detailed search of every grid zone. It was described as a spider's web of string in the forest. In the summer of 2018, so that was a while after, State police used sniffer dogs trained to detect cadavers to go through portions of the woods and field near where Messick disappeared. State police investigator John Dayette said no clues were found, but the police investigation was ongoing. So one of the interesting parts about this disappearance and one of the reasons it keeps popping up on missing 411 mysterious disappearances are this supposed sound Mm -hmm. that a couple people in the group heard. So in the 2019 movie, Missing 411, The Hunted, featuring David Politis, one of the hunting group was interviewed. He says, quote, I heard a strange noise in the woods, but I don't know what it was. Just a different noise from what I usually hear, you know? And the interviewer said, like what? And then he said, it'd be hard to explain because, but it was different. Something different that I never heard before in the woods. I just can't say what it was, you know? Interviewer asks, how long in duration was it? Was it two or three seconds? And he answers, no, it was just whatever it is, you know? And the interviewer says, how how far away was it? 
And he says, I'd say it was probably 150 yards, something like that. Interviewer asks, was it towards Tom or away from Tom? And then he answers, this was up towards the hill, the top of the hill. Yeah. And the interviewer says, did you tell the cops this? And he responds, yeah, I told them that, but they just passed it off, you know. His son, Sid Sharp Jr., says when asked by Politis about the sound his father heard, he replies, quote, he said he heard some kind of snapping or cracking sound that was strange. It wasn't something he normally hears in the woods. He goes on to say, quote, he said it almost sounded like a big trap closing or Ooh, something. That's creepy. So it's just that's that's one of the reasons that this keeps showing up in the mysterious disappearances is because of this sound. Yeah. And I don't, like, this is all that there is out there about the sound. Yeah. And from what I've read, if it was up near the top of this hill, like, other other researchers went to look at this area, and they said there's no way that Thomas would have been able to scramble up that hill. But they said it's also hard to determine exactly where sounds are right. coming from in the forest. Sure. But that is one of the big sticking points with this missing 411 case is this sound that, but it's weird. Only one uh, person then, heard it? Yeah. Okay. But then people are saying, like, people are saying, why didn't the first guy they ask say it was like a trap closing? He just kept giving these answers that were just like, totally it, was something, it was something that you just you shouldn't hear in the woods. And I don't understand, like, what he means by the sound of a big trap closing. Is it like a bear trap? Or, like, what is the sound? I pictured a big metal I pictured a big metal thing going clink. Yeah, yeah. Like, a, like the sound a bear trap makes when it closes. But, like, the size of a... Like something, the size of a per like a, that would like a person, yeah. yeah. Because you wouldn't hear that from 150. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe Some you people would. speculate it might have been like a falling tree, right? Uh, but that's one of the that's one of the weird things about this this case is mm. this strange sound of quote a big trap closing or something. And maybe he was being sort of elusive about it because he's weird about it you know what i mean yeah, like because he, he didn't want to sound like a, a, a weirdo saying yeah exactly that like a big trap but he confided closing. in his son and said exactly yeah. what he thought it sounded like mm -hmm. it's very possible he just sounds like he was reluctant to actually say what it was uh but it, that's basically it for what we know f about his disappearance mm -hmm. so i i uh again watch the documentary because it's very good but there are theories about what happened to him. One of the biggest theories, of course, he just got lost in the woods. The search area had many caves, crevices, and other hazards. Could he have somehow fallen down into one of these? Yeah. For a man of his age, was he really mobile enough? Why were there no clues on the ground despite the methodical grid search? Right. You know, so that almost lends believability to the idea When did that they bring dogs out there? They brought dogs out, like, shortly after okay. he disappeared. Hmm. Uh, you just think how far can an 82-year-old, although it doesn't sound like he was out of shape or had mobility issues, yeah, so yeah. he could probably get pretty far in four hours. Well, the thing is that's also huge. Luke, uh, Lake George Wild Forest is 71,133 acres in size, so it's huge. Yeah. You know, it's the dead of winter. I mean, it, I guess it was cold that day, but it wasn't like... I think it'd be easier to track him in winter, too, if there was snow on the I ground. I don't think there was snow on the ground oh. yet, but I, I think it was cool, but I don't think that it was, like, freezing, freezing. Okay. It was November, right? Yeah. Uh, his son stated, quote, The underbrush and plant life in this area is extremely thick. Walking through the woods, you trip over somebody, never mind not see him. Hmm. So it's possible that he's still out there somewhere. You know, but would he have gone into the thick? The dogs would have found him, though. Yeah, like a couple podcasters I listened to went out there to the same exact area, and they're like, you would not. Some, some of it is just like a woods, like you walk through here, like when you walk through Kettle Moraine or whatever, but then some of it is like super dense, like you would not walk through it. And it's like, why would he go into some kind of wooded area well, like that? Well, and was this odd behavior for him? Like, obviously, this was a, a method of hunting they've used, and he was a stationary person. Was it normal for him to get up and wander off? Well, that's off? what we're going to talk about right now because this okay. comes from somebody on Reddit that does... He did a podcast about it. I'm not sure who he was. 
I, I got the name Brendan Scott, so I think he did a podcast about it, but he says on Reddit, quote, so while continuing our research for our forthcoming documentary on the community and SAR operations surrounding Tom Messick, I ran into the forest ranger that was the first one into the woods on that day. After receiving the distress call from one of the younger hunters who drive out to Horicon to get cell service, he spoke with all three of the elderly hunters, Sid, Albert, and Joe, and Joe told him that after he and Tom walked to the large spruce tree 400 yards up the road, Tom told him that he didn't feel like sitting as it was too cold for him. Mm. It was like around 37 degrees, I guess. So he wanted to walk around the woods in that area and see what he could find for deer. So Tom never sat down on a big rock like in the Missing 411 documentary. He walked slowly up the hill towards the crest and to the northeast, just filling you all in on our progress. We've uncovered a lot more facts in this case that we will share in our film. Okay, so that makes sense that he would be getting up and walking around. Yep. Somebody else writes, I was actually one of the searchers for this one. Also happened to camp in that same area. I'm honestly not aware of any caves in the immediate area there or sinkhole activity or abandoned mines. The grids we searched went from open forest with plenty of visibility to not being able to see my hands and feet pretty quick. If there was, however, a mine shaft or a sinkhole, we would have seen it. The weird thing about this search is that we found absolutely nothing. No candy wrappers, no rifle, no clothing, no walkie-talkie, nothing. Anyway, just adding my two cents, I've been Googling for some hunting areas and happen to be heading up that way to hunt the week after Thanksgiving this year. I'll be on the lookout for some clues, but I'm pretty sure the manpower we had in the woods over the years that found nothing shows that there is nothing out there that is findable. And then he writes, um, I don't know if this is him or the doc or the, the podcast guy but somebody writes so on our latest trip up to lily pond we, we we i think this is the podcaster guy because i saw this video we recorded the trip from highway 8 to the parking area where they parked at i will put the link to that video in the bottom of this reply i believe that after watching the clip it'll give you an idea of what we are up against there in the lake george wild forest the terrain is very dense the area part of the forest where Mr. Messick went missing is incredibly rocky, and if you were to walk straight ahead from where he was sitting, it's a steep hill that we do not believe he would have walked up. We used metal detectors in the immediate area and in a straight line and 50 yards wide up the hill. There was a brief level of excitement when we locked onto something that ended up being just a piece of steel pipe. We thought it might have been the rifle. Mm. You'll see how remote the road access is, and that removes the idea of anybody driving on the road to nab him. There's little room to navigate and hardly anywhere to turn around. We also conducted noise and sound carrying experiments. It's amazing how well sound travels up there. I could easily be heard from a distance of 150 yards from barely raising my voice above conversation level. So any kind of ruckus or argument would easily have been heard by the other hunters. Somebody else writes, last winter I was visiting with my wife's family in the Adirondacks. 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 (laughs) I went out to the area. (laughs) struggle with that one. I know. And went out to the area where Tom went missing. We parked on the side of the road and hiked down to the pond at the end of the trail, trying to identify the specific rocks they were sitting on during their hunt. I'm a former special operations officer and a paratrooper, so Tom's case really piqued my interest as I had some free time during the holidays. I've read some analysis on this in the sub, and I wanted to give some environmental factors, observations, and my belief of what happened. The first thing to note is that there were no gunshots heard during the time of his disappearance. It was actually incredibly quiet based on the reports. Secondly, given the amount of dead leaves on the ground for the majority of that season, I figured that there would be at least some noise. Given search efforts that covered a very wide area, I assumed that there were very few places he could disappear, with the exception of the pond at the end of the trail. To get to the pond, though, he would have to walk by some of the folks that he was out with. As I went out there, there were two things that I believe were of some use. There is a running stream, and it is fairly loud. It runs almost parallel to the walking-slash-driving trail that they were close to. The stream is on the same side of the trail as the deer drive, and it is certainly loud enough to drown out leaves crunching at 100 yards. There is a medium-sized marsh along the path to get to their position. If one were to go across the trail and walk in a straight line from their position or follow the trail back, it's easy to walk into the marsh. I truly believe that he is in that marsh. I think he wandered off or became disoriented and after going back to pee or stretch his legs, got lost in the woods. As he walked away, he fell into the marsh and couldn't get out and sank in. Hmm. 
My less favorite theory is that he was killed or died naturally and was removed from the area, which could be a reason that the others who were with him stayed so long. Against this theory, he was an ex-military hunting safety instructor, taught survival training, he was with well-seasoned hunters, and he knew exactly what to do in these types of situations. He had a walkie-talkie and a gun oh, to signal with. he had a walkie-talkie? With. Yeah, and a gun to signal with. So, huh. so they all had walkie-talkies. Yeah, they all had walkie-talkies. Hmm. So, you know, the theory, one of the knocks against him getting lost is he had a walkie-talkie. Right. He had a walkie-talkie. He had his rifle. I mean, you can get out of range, I'm sure. Yeah, but he can shoot his rifle into right. the air and, pe- and people will, his people he was with would have heard it. Right. You know, but he didn't That's do that. Odd. Yeah. Unless he you were incapacitated somehow. Yeah, he didn't do, he didn't use his walkie-talkie. They never found it. They never found his rifle. Hmm. Uh, another possible Did theory. Did he have a cell phone? No, hmm. no. Another possible theory is animal attack, but there. You would have found evidence exactly. Of that. That's the, that's the argument against any kind of animal attack is that there would have been blood. The dogs would have definitely, definitely. found some. You know, there would have been scattered, torn clothing. Mm-hmm. There would have been remains. There would have been blood. There would have been. Yeah. You would have heard him being attacked by an animal because they were all relatively close to each other. Right. So and I don't being think very quiet. Yeah. Yep. So I don't think animal attack is an option in this one. This is fascinating to hear people who were actually part of the search or know the area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and now another one that kind of has two sub theories under it is foul play. One of the ideas is random abduction. Of an 82-year-old man? That's, that's the thing. <laughs> uh, somebody on Reddit, wealthy? <laughs> somebody on Reddit writes... I camp at Lily Pond almost every summer. There's no way someone could have killed him and dragged him out of there without there being some kind of evidence, which I totally agree with. Mm-hmm. Uh, Beverly, I'm not sure. Is Beverly his wife? Beverly might be his wife. Beverly says he'd been in the woods since he was a boy, and if he got lost, he would have cut a piece of his jacket and tied it to a tree and done the other things that he learned and that he taught everybody in hunter safety and survival. His wife said that her greatest fear was that he was the victim. So Beverly is not his wife. (laughs) No, but I think Beverly is his wife. But then it goes on to say his wife said her greatest fear was that he was the victim of foul play. Hmm. She says, the only thing I can think of is that maybe somebody came by in a quad, hurt him, got scared and drove him out of there. I keep praying they'll find him so we have some closure. I keep worrying that I didn't tell him I loved him the last day I saw him alive. That's sad. That's hard. But... You would have heard a quad coming up the road. Right. And, uh, yeah, it's just, I don't, I can't see that. That's the kind of sound that carries through the woods, too. Somebody else says, it's a plausible theory, but the problem is that there is only one road in. They were at the very end of it, and all the watchers were 40 yards off the road. Any vehicle coming or going would have been heard and seen by all of them. An ATV coming in from the backside trails is a possibility, but those are even louder and would have definitely been heard and from much further distances. An electronic ATV could be much quieter, but I don't think those were even around in 2015. And if they were, they'd still be in their infancy and quite rare, especially to be used by any serious hunters. Hmm. Somebody else says, I thought Tom was furthest from the lake, which he was. Tom was at the top of the line of hunters uh, that were positioned to wait. I thought Tom was furthest from the lake, so closest to the road's exit. A truck could have come to Tom first and stopped. Uh, Somebody says, deer drives can be intense. You are looking for a deer that could be hauling hauling butt past you with very little time to react. So it's possible the other hunters were hyper-focused on the woods in front of them and clueless about what was behind them. Mm. But you're still going to hear something more suspicious. I would think so. Uh, One of the theories is that the trap sound they heard was the truck door closing yes the, oh. the cab of a truck clo- after they threw him uh incapacitated him put him in the back of a truck sure but the thing is like the, everybody was so close to the road and if you uh, the the youtube video of the guys that went down the road and filmed it's a it's a, not a paved road it's a crappy rocky like you cannot go fast on that road mm. you just can't mm-hmm. so a truck is not going to speed in there Knock him out, throw him in the back and of the why? cab. why? I don't understand yeah, why. I don't know. I don't What's know. What's the motive behind it? I don't know. Uh, a, a serial killer would be the only motive, like somebody who just kills people for sport. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, one of the other theories that kind of goes along with this is that it was a military abduction. Somebody says, 
I read on another site a post by an alleged whistleblower who said the loud metallic type sound sometimes heard in wilderness areas is related to deep underground military bases, which Mm. we talked about. Something to do with the huge concealed doors periodically opening to ventilate air into the bases. Hmm. So that this person's theory is that... Now we're getting deep. That he was near (laughs) like an opening to a deep underground military base (laughs) and it opened to vent the air. He saw it, so the military took him in and killed him because he knew or he lives down there now. or he lives down there now because but i don't know i'm not buying the, the i don't know about i'm not that. buying the trap sound was a deep underground military base yeah letting air in no you know no. but i feel like a truck door is a little more plausible yeah uh, yeah but another one and this one is interesting is the idea of a serial killer sure Surprisingly, the FBI arrived on the fourth day, November 19th. That would explain the FBI. This was unusual as the FBI never usually gets involved in these types of missing person cases unless it falls under federal jurisdiction or happened on federal land. Tom's wife, Beverly, it is his wife, Tom's wife, Beverly says, oh, I already said that one, that the FBI said something's not right with Mm -hmm. with the case. Um... Another pretty interesting lesser known part of this whole thing is that just 11 days after Tom went missing, 40 miles south of his last known location, another man by the name of Fred Drum, age 68, also completely vanished from his farm without a trace. I believe this further solidifies the serial killer theory. Frederick Fritz Drum was last seen on Thanksgiving morning on November 24th, 2015 in his house. Uh... In his house, his wife came home from having breakfast with some friends, and when she walked in, he was nowhere to be found. Investigators believe that he might have left home on foot that morning to hunt. A large search has failed to turn up any sign of him. Hmm. So somebody, th- people think there might be a serial killer killing. Geriatric serial killers serial generally killer. don't kill old yeah, men. men. Uh, huh. and if another, yeah, they like to target women. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and how... Where are you going to go with them? Right. How are you, are you going to, if you bring your vehicle in the woods, people are going to hear you that are with him. If you knock him out. This guy was there's, alone though. Yeah. The second there's, guy. If there's a struggle. Yeah. The second guy. Which they don't even know. He no, but hunting. then they think another theory maybe that ties in with that. It was, a, it was some kind of hit gone wrong that the second guy was the guy that had the hit put on him. And for some reason they thought Tom was that guy. So a hitman killed Tom and wasn't supposed to. And it was supposed to be this so second guy, but that is kind of far fetched. <laughs> what did this old guy do that required a hit? Oh, I, I don't. Know. I mean, I suppose you, I could hire a hitman. I mean, it doesn't have to be some deep conspiracy thing. Yeah. So I, I, <laughs> and what do you think about the abduction slash serial killer theory? I just don't don't think you can do it quietly and and get him out of there without people hearing your truck, hearing your vehicle. You know, I do agree with the idea that the trap sound could be something to do with I think with the a... second guy's way more plausible. He, he could have just been taken from his home. We have no idea what happened to him. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah. Is I don't know. S- serial killer? Nothing really makes sense. Serial killer going after retirees? Like, yeah, I don't know. I think it would be easier for the... It's more plausible for the second guy, but for the main guy we're talking about here, that doesn't feel plausible to me. Nothing feels plausible. No. I no. feel like there should be some evidence. There should be so, something. This next one. That's why Missing 411 is so frustrating <laughs> and fascinating. Um, no theory makes sense. And, you know, kind of going back to the sinkhole slash pit slash well. Okay, that's theory. the most plausible thing is that he fell in a you crevasse think so? or something. Yeah. Somebody on Reddit says, since the dawn of time, human hunters have utilized gravity as a weapon via the trapping pit. Nowadays in the U.S., these would be illegal traps set by a poacher or group of poachers and could be designed to remain concealed after being sprung to avoid detection by park officials, game wardens, and other hunters. Consider the case of Tom Messick's disappearance. A a strange sound, quote, kind of like a giant steel trap closing, was heard about midway through the hunt by the member of the hunting party who was closest to Tom's last known position. Note that while it's said that the sound came from the direction of the pushers, not towards Tom, sound does not always seem to come from the direction of its origin, and no one actually knows where Tom was when this sound happened. Now let me explain two possible kinds of self-closing pit traps. A pit trap that lets something fall in through a concealed spring-loaded trap door or pair of doors, which then closes back up to the original position. I could explain the sound. And optionally engages a mechanism preventing the trap from being reopened again the same way. 
If Tom fell in such a trap and was killed or incapacitated by the fall or spikes therein, but <laughs> that just sounds like I don't know. Then People it could exp- do this though. The, yeah, but like yeah, but not in the woods in New York. I don't think. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, then it could explain why search parties with dogs found no trace of him, not even a scent trail or piece of trash, assuming the trap doors are relatively sealed from odors coming out. And if you're going to go through all this trouble of making this kind of a trap, why would you neglect such an obvious detail? Searchers could have actually walked right over the top of the trap and never knew it was there unless they were specifically checking for traps. Old school version of trap one, where instead of a spring loaded door that recloses, we have a boulder that is held in place by a prop such as a wedge rock or log. When something falls through the trap door into the pit trap, the prop gets pulled away from the boulder by a line and a rope and falls into the pit along with the prey. Finally, the boulder now rolls onto the pit where it comes to rest, covering the only means of escape by sealing off the opening. Such a rolling boulder trap is one of the oldest kinds of traps known to man. It was popularized by the famous opening sequence of the first Indiana Jones movie, but Mm. Spielberg didn't invent the idea. It generally requires at least two people to set traps like this. If there are some poachers out there who have taken up this ancient and now illegal style of hunting as a hobby, setting this kind of trap to get large game in multiple locations around where they live, this could account for four other mysteries mentioned by David Politis. If this, it could explain why this kind of disappearance tends to happen in clusters around a particular area. Mm, that's true. Uh, it could explain the FBI's interest in the case, especially if they suspect the same individuals might be setting pit traps in multiple states or they're part of a large ring of trappers, I guess. Hmm. By the way, and I agree with this, this is, this is what I need to find out more about. By the way, mm-hmm. concerning the FBI's reluctance to explain the exact nature of their interest in Messick's disappearance... Far too much has been read into this. It's a well-known standard operating procedure for any law enforcement investigators to be kept or investigations to be kept secret until and unless the crime is solved because suspects who don't know about an investigation are more likely to get caught. So mm-hmm. that's why the FBI isn't talking because they don't want to let whatever sure. they're looking for know that they're on to them. Mm-hmm. You know. That makes sense. Now, while I have no new evidence that suggests pit traps or why the FBI showed up, my point is simply that this is a plausible reason, along with abduction or homicide, as to why federal authorities might take interest in such a high-profile case. In all the discussions, videos, and articles I've seen about the case, not once have I seen any indication that the possibility of a pit trap was hinted at, let alone seriously considered. Alien abductions, Bigfoot, skinwalkers, the predator, serial killers, kidnappers, dogmen, mothmen, wild feral men, and secret cave networks full of unimaginable creatures have all been mentioned. But no one mentioned a simple pit trap, which humans have been utilizing since prehistoric times. I mean, Tom's friend even said he heard what sounded like a big steel trap. Now, I'm not saying that I don't believe in the paranormal. I have, in fact, had multiple paranormal experiences. All I'm saying is, before we start seriously considering a paranormal explanation, first we need to rule out the more likely, more mundane explanations. I like this person. I do, I do too. <laughs> like they'd be... But then somebody responds to them, I gotta hand it to you. You obviously gave this a lot of thought, and for that I thank you. I've been to Lily Pond several times over the last few months as my research group has been investigating this disappearance. We have indeed been metal detecting the area as much as we can. So far, we have detected up road approximately 500, 600 yards from the parking area and only about 50 yards into the woods on both sides of the road. The area is both extremely hilly and rocky and densely forested and marshy. Uh, Sid Sharp was the hunter that claimed to have heard the sound, and he was the second of the four hunters, so he was not the hunter closest to Thomas. So granted that even though we've only started our mapping with our metal detectors, what strikes me as a giant hole in your theory is the fact that when we asked several local hunters, every single one of them said that no one local hunts deer or any kind of large game near Lily Pond as there simply aren't any big or medium-sized game there. The deer in the area seem to mostly be in the area of Shroon Lake, which which is a fairly long distance away from Lily Pond. That being said, why would any outdoorsman or trapper as trained in hunting game and building, building some seriously advanced trap, as whoever could create such deadly and undetectable contraptions, spend the time and energy constructing these so-called killer traps in an area that has no serious game? These traps would require checking every week or so to prevent rotting of the game, correct? So I guess I'm thanking you for a well-thought-out theory, but challenging it all the same. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and then the the guy responds and says, I'm not from there, nor have I ever been there, but I'd be pretty skeptical of any old coots who claim there are no deer in that area. Deer are pretty ubiquitous. Why should they not be found there, especially near a water source? It doesn't make sense. Locals might tell you there's no game in that area because they want to keep it for themselves. Hmm. 
Also, given the notoriety of that spot, it's possible it was overhunted for a long time by people all over the state, which could explain why there are few deer there now, but that doesn't mean that there weren't deer there when he disappeared. All good stuff. All good stuff. So, hmm. yeah. I have um, no theories on this one. An- another theory <laughs> is that a car hit him on that road mm-hmm. accidentally and f- freaked out and took packed his body and, drove away. and packed him up and drove away. But again, you would have heard, A, that road is rocky and crappy. You are not going to speed. I mean, you would have maybe hit him and, and bruised him, but I don't think, I don't think mm. you could get fast enough on that road that you would have killed somebody. Yeah, an 82-year-old man, though? Yeah, but you're also going to hear, fragile. like other hunters would have heard the truck coming up the road because they were that close to the yeah. road. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you know, you know, <laughs> so now we get to this one. This is, this is one that I kind of didn't want to bring up because I don't, it's, I don't want it to open like any kind of can of worms or anything, but this is what the podcast that I was listening to on the way out here. This is kind of their theory. And that is family foul play. On Reddit, somebody said, quote, after having talked to a person who claims to know the Messick family, I'm in this camp. Somebody else says, I'm intrigued by your statement. Can you elaborate more on what it was said that leads you to this conclusion? And the person responds, quote, family politics plus the family is evil plus they made sure every trace of him disappeared. Uh, And then this is this. uh, I read this before I rewatched the documentary. Somebody says, I'm actually leaning towards this this theory even before I read your comments. The son doesn't seem too upset in the Missing 411 documentary. He had some odd reactions and answers to Politis' questions. So I watched it. Look, I need to rewatch it. I watched it. I don't think he does. Hmm. I mean, he people said he has a smirk on his face the whole time. And I, I, I read this and I'm like, I'm going to see. He doesn't look sketchy to me. He looks like, I mean, it's been years. It's been a few years. Like it devastated me when my dad died, but I can talk about it now without breaking down, you mm-hmm. know? And also it's, everyone reacts differently to stuff like this. Exactly. Everyone handles stuff exactly. differently. Exactly. But a lot of people pointed towards you know, him. No, if his behavior were yeah. sketchy in the days leading up to and after, that'd be one thing. Yeah. But a lot of people point towards him being suspicious. So then I watched it and I'm like, He's not suspicious at all. He's fine. So again, watch I the documentary. Do that. I do too. I do too. Let's throw shade on the family now. Yep. Somebody else we're out of theories. Somebody else writes, quote, I have a source very close to the family that says it was foul play. He was killed and disposed of before the hunting trip. Right. That is why the FBI investigated the case, but they could not find the body. Were all of the and hunters family though? A lot of them were family or I think fam- friends of the family. And they were all in on and it. That's the thing. That's the thing is that... Uh, yeah, a lot of people believe, and the podcast I listened to this morning said that they believe he was never even out there in the first place, that they killed him before this, mm. and then went out there. Well, that would and explain up, why there's no trace. And came up with the cover story. Yeah. So you're going to have all these people, like these six or seven people, all Why? All in what did on the this? guy do? I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, somebody responds, somebody responds saying, I feel like it would be extremely gutsy on his wife's behalf to stage a cover up and then go on the documentary that includes his case. I'm sure it's been done before, but I don't get that feeling from her. And she seemed really sweet and stuff during the, and then somebody else responds as a relation to this guy. I can assure you that the Messick family is responsible for his disappearance. Great uncle Tom on my dad's side. Couldn't get married fast enough to dump that twisted family name. They are some crazy MFers. Really? Yep. And then, and then, I mean, who knows? And then somebody responded to him. Well, then why not kill him before? And then he responded, I think they did. I don't think he was even there that day. And somebody responds to me, that's the only way all the pieces fit. There was no trace of him, not even footprints of, of where they say they left him. The only thing that makes sense to me is that he was never there. He was killed the day before, probably. And then they staged the hunting trip plan. And here we are. And that's where all the focus of the search was then. Yeah. They're yeah, and that, that's, what, that's their... what the podcast I listened to this morning said. Yeah. They wanted to bump up the paranormal aspect of it to get people to not consider the fact that the family killed them. Mm. But I just don't. I just don't buy that. I just don't. I don't. You're going to have seven people all in on this. And mm-hmm. what did they get out of this? And why would they go on? Yeah, the, what's the why, why was his brother interviewed on the documentary? Unless yeah. you want, like, if you wanted them, if you wanted to take suspicion off you for killing him, 
once you ramp up the weirdness, the paranormal stuff in the case, instead of just coming up with this trap thing that the guy didn't even say it sounded like a trap, his son said that, Hmm. you know, so wouldn't you be like, yeah, we saw some weird glowing light in the woods, (laughs) right? you know, to make it more, to make it more mysterious than what they did. So I just do not buy. And like seeing the interview with his mom and his brother, I don't think they seem suspicious at all. I I really don't. I also think if the FBI were truly involved, they would have explored this as an option. They would not have just assumed no foul play. They would have absolutely explored that. And they would have uncovered something, I think. Yeah, I I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just don't buy, I just can't buy the fact that the six or seven of them were all sworn. One of the other theories is that with the way they were hunting where they, these guys were leading them in that somebody accidentally shot, shot him, him and panicked and buried him in the woods, but it happens. And then why would you... Again, there'd be blood. Yeah, there'd be, yeah. And you, and all six or DNA seven people evidence. out there are going right. to make a pact to not say anything about it. But everything, ev- admittedly, everything almost points to the fact that he was never out there. Mm-hmm. Like people said, I don't remember where it was, but somebody said like his spot where he supposedly sat was never even like brushed off when they went out the next day. Like he never sat down there. But then the other person said he kind of didn't sit down he because it was to too cold, was cold. So he got up and kind of wandered around. Yeah. But this is just one where none of it makes sense. A head sense. scratcher. It is a head scratcher. Uh, here's a couple paranormal things. Somebody writes, quote, I grew up in Pine Bush, New York, a small farm town known for UFOs and paranormal activity for decades. There was a kid named Joe Helt who disappeared from the ridge after hanging out with a group of kids on a cold January night in an abandoned ski lodge. That case has not been solved after 34 years. Many people speculated that he was killed by some other kids after a dispute over drugs. That happened in 1987. Around 2006, I visited a waterfall on the same ridge with a small group of friends. At that time, I heard a weird, loud noise, kind of like a powerful vacuum, which suddenly stopped like a door closing. Hmm. It was very loud and seemed to be coming from the air a few feet, uh, ab- a few hundred feet above the waterfall. It almost sounded like an airlock. It sounded powerful. I always thought that was weird, but now when I read the accounts of Thomas Messick and these other people, it's not mysterious. It's not just mysterious, but it's highly disturbing. Could it be that people are people are somehow being sucked into another place, either by accident or on purpose? You know, so they're tying this weird sound in some kind of interdimensional portal. Yeah, sucking people. Somebody writes what what bugs me about the sound the friend or is that the um, underground military base? Deep underground military base. What bugs me about the sound that a friend heard, when Politis asked Tom's friend what it sounded like, the friend just said, I don't know, I can't explain it. It was the friend's son who said it sounded like a trap closing. But why didn't the friend describe the sound? Why his it son? Is weird. I want to hear from the person who heard it, not a secondhand account. It was almost like the friend didn't want to describe the sound he heard because he didn't want to lie because he never really heard a sound. Mm. You know, possible. Could be. Another theory, which I thought was interesting, is that the sound they heard... Some people believe that that Messick walked into the marsh accidentally, and the sound they heard was his gun being discharged underwater. Like mm. he was went got sucked underwater right away and tried to shoot his rifle as a sign, but it was muted because he was underwater. Huh. But people, other people said they searched that marsh really well. Yeah, and if you walk into a marsh, are you also going to sink that fast that you're going to be that you can't shoot know. your gun in the air? And somebody else writes, I talked to a person who claims to know the family, and this person said the following earlier to me this year, quote, they're not a normal family. They got some ties into some serious occult type stuff. Really? (laughs) No idea. Hmm. Somebody else writes, I've been in that neck of the woods quite a few times. It's a strange place. Lots of Bigfoot stories in the area. Poor Bigfoot. I know. Scapegoat. Yeah, I know. I don't... uh, (laughs) I got to get into the FBI stuff to see if an, if the FBI, is it is it suspicious that the FBI shows up in an investigation like this? Four days into the investigation, somebody said. And also, even if it were foul play, again, the FBI is not going to show up until specific criteria are met, in my, in my understanding. Yeah. Like, they don't show up to every homicide that happens. Yeah. And last but not least, somebody writes, quote, 
Who actually knows if these FBI agents were actually FBI? They could have been assassins who knew he had some sort of secret and was about to give it up, and they did away with him. Oh, boy. (laughs) So there we go. (laughs) An investigation into Messick's disappearance is still classified as an active missing persons case by authorities. So on one of the Reddit ones I read, they had a poll that people could vote for what they think happened. So starting from least likely, likely. most likely, 47 people, 7.8% said he faked his own death. (laughs) Which, like, if you're 82 years old, are you going to fake your own death? Why? I don't know. Uh, Unless his family Uh, was that crazy and he wanted to get away from it. 15.9% thought a wild animal took him. Don't see that because... There'd be evidence. 17.4% said killed by a person known to him. Hmm. 18% said a stroke or amnesia and wandered off. 18.7% 18.7% said fell into a sinkhole. And the majority, 22.3%, said abducted by an unknown person or group. So a lot of people think he was abducted, but I just don't... Again, where's I, the motive? Where's the motive? Where's the accounts of a sound of somebody coming? I mean, if you snuck up on in the woods, clonked him over the head immediately, still, what are you going to do with him? You're going to have to drag him out, and people mm-hmm. would have probably heard you. And where are you going to drag him to? Or they would have found evidence of that. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I got for Thomas Messick. I don't know. I honestly... I have no idea. You know, I was totally against the family doing it idea, but then that podcast I listened to on the way down here seemed really to believe that the family killed him, but I cannot I cannot wrap my mind around that. I just can't. I, that They're going to keep this a secret. They're going to kill him. And then they're they're gonna go on a documentary about what happened and then it'll not, make you look the least not, guilty not though. Embellish it to make it more mysterious sounding. You know, if they would have added a couple little more things here and there to make it more missing four one one ish, then I could see it. But there wasn't a whole lot of weirdness or other was, than the sound. The sound is the only thing Or they executed this crime perfectly because we're really poo pooing on that they did <laughs> that it. Could be. It's possible, but what what do I'm they not get? Ruling what, that out. what do they get out of it? I don't know. Maybe I don't know. You know. All so what do you think? What do you think happened? Everyone to him? has secrets. <laughs> what do you think happened to him? I don't know. I can't really. I can't say. One Maybe way I'm going to put a hit on you to get get into get access to that sweet, strange sessions PayPal money. <laughs> you already have access. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. No, never mind. Call, call, call off my hitman. It's off. It's off. <laughs> it's off. <laughs> I mean, what do you go, think? Go, Which go. of the what theory do you think? I'm starting to leave, lean towards the family. <laughs> Seriously, watch the documentary. Like, well, wa- I have watched it. <laughs> watch it again. I do. Like, I want to watch it again with that spin on it. Yeah, like it's all. It's the mind. first segment, so you can shut it off after the first segment. It's only like 20 minutes long. I mean, a lot of people, but like, killers seeing... will insert themselves into the investigation. Part of it is for the thrill, but also part of it is, uh, how, why would I be guilty if I'm here helping you? Yeah, I can't be guilty. I'm helping you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean to me. Like the only people that have any knowledge of him being there that day is the family Mm because there's no trace of him whatsoever. That's the only thing that gives any plausibility to the family killing him. That it happened before and he was never there. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. This is one where I literally don't know what theory I believe in. Like none of them completely make sense to me. No, nothing. And that's the thing with missing 411. There's never one theory that hits all the check. The only thing that makes sense is that he was never there that day, but then that would mean the family is lying, which would mean that there was some foul foul play. play. But I cannot get my brain to accept that his family killed him. I just can't. And why an 82-year-old man? I don't know. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of time left anyway. You know? I don't know. So what do you guys think Ugh. on this one? Because I'm stumped. I know I do... we have listeners in New York. Maybe yeah. they're more familiar with this yeah. case. So I don't know what to think. <sighs> Let us know what you guys think. Yeah. On to my second one. This one, again, is a lot of reading because this is the only thing I could really come up with for a deep dive on this one. But I think we talked about this in our first Missing 411 episode. This is one that fascinates people, and this is one that constantly shows up on Strangest Missing 411, even though there's very little about it. It is the Robot Grandma one. Oh, yes. I remember this. Yep. This is a little kid, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I don't remember where I got this from. So somebody writes, I'm really bad. I got to start like putting more notes in here where I got this from. This is from a website. Somebody writes, David starts the account. David Polita starts the account of the disappearance by stating that he has changed the names and dates surrounding the event in order to protect the identity of the family. It did, however, occur in 2010. 
The location of this incident was near Mount Shasta, California. The age of the child who went missing was three years old at the time. We will refer to him as John Doe. John was camping with his family on the banks of a large creek. At approximately 6 o'clock p.m., John disappeared. The parents searched for their son for a number of hours before contacting the local sheriff and United States Forest Service. Approximately five hours after John went missing, he was found lying in a thicket directly next to a trail the searchers had been using. I want to interject here and say that in most of these cases, the people who go missing are never found or are found dead, so they were in no position to tell anyone what had happened to them. Well, David Politis goes on to say that the parents of John Doe contacted him after hearing about his investigation into these disappearances with a bizarre story. About three weeks after the incident, John Doe's grandmother said her grandson told her that, quote, he didn't like his other grandma, Cappy, which is his, na- his name for the grandma, Kathy. When she asked him to explain further, he said, quote, Don't you remember when I was lost in the woods? The other grandma, Cappy, grabbed me and took me to a creepy place. She's really a robot. It was a cave with spiders, and there were purses and guns. I was too scared, so I didn't touch anything. But when she climbed a ladder, the light made her look like a robot. There were other robots there, too, but they didn't move. She made me lay down to look at my tummy. Then she tried to get me to go poop on a piece of sticky paper, but I couldn't go. How old is this kid? Three. Okay. Ooh, three. She told me then that I am from outer space and they put me in my mom's tummy. Then she took me back to the river and told me to wait under the bush until someone found me. She also states that her grandson grandson said, quote, she had your same hair, your feet, and even your face. Your feet. <laughs> that scared her deeply. The idea of some kind of doppelganger taking on her own image to abduct her grandson. She says she got the impression that her grandson may have been talking about a hologram because of the way he described the light sparkling on the strange woman. His grandmother was so horrified and called her grandmother was his grandmother was horrified and called her son, the boy's father, who told her that he had heard the same story from the boy a few few days ago. She admitted that she probably would have written off her grandson's story to a child's overactive imagination if it wasn't for a strange experience that happened to her a year ago when she was camping in the same area. She claims that she woke up one morning face down in the dirt, having been removed from her tent and sleeping bag. She also had a puncture wound on her on her on the back of her head. She said she felt violently ill that morning and felt strangely emotionless, so she thought she'd been bitten by a poisonous spider. She said that she was with a friend who'd been sleeping in his separate camper, and he also woke up with a strange bite on the back of his neck and felt ill as well. The only strange thing she could recall was seeing red eyes shining through the trees in their flashlights the night before, which they thought were deer. Uh, this is from the book, David Politis's book, Missing 411. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The woman spoke to him in a very nice and polite way. He stated that she was interested in his tummy. He explained that he thought he, that he was talking with his grandma the entire time until he saw sparks come from her head. He then started to believe she was a robot. He said he saw guns and purses that had lots of dust on them on the walls of the cave and also saw other robots in the cave that never moved. John Doe explained that near the end of the time with the lady, she placed a piece of sticky paper on the ground and told him that she wanted him to poop on the paper. He said he didn't have to. It was sometime after this point that she took him from the room and put him under the bush and told him to stay there. He never explained how he got from the room, but does remember being found. So there you go. That's what I got so for that. So bizarre. So now I managed to find the grandmother's actual account mm. on Above Top Secret where she talks about this. There's a whole thread where she goes into this. So this this is the words of Grandma Kathy or Grandma Cappy, Grandma as Cappy. he says. So these are her exact words. And this is this okay. is the only thing I could find from this deep dive. And there's a lot here, so I'm going to be reading a lot. Posted on November 15th, 2012, her name on there, Miss Cat One, she says, quote, Last fall, my three-and-a-half-year-old grandson was lost in the Shasta Forest for five hours. Thanks to volunteers and rescue personnel, he was found. My son said, quote, He was here, then within a second he was gone. They thought he had been abducted by other campers. Trust me, that's the worst nightmare ever. About three weeks after this happened, he was at my house, and out of the blue he stated, quote, I don't like the other Grandma Cappy, which is his name for me, Grandma Cathy. I said, quote, what are you talking about, buddy? I'm the only Grandma Cappy. He said, quote, don't you remember when I was lost in the woods? Well, the other Grandma Cappy grabbed me and took me to a creepy place. She's really a robot. I was thinking he was telling me a story, so I asked him, what was creepy about it? Why do you think she was a robot? He responded, he responded, quote, it was a cave with spiders and there were purses and guns. I was too scared, so I didn't touch anything. 
but when she climbed a ladder, the light made her look like a robot. There were other robots too, but they didn't move. So I asked him, what did she do to you, buddy? He says, quote, she made me lie down and look at my tummy, and then she tried to get me to poop on a sticky paper, but I couldn't go. <laughs> I keep giggling. I know. <laughs> she told me that I am from outer space, and they put me in my mom's tummy. Then she took me back to the river and said to wait under the bush until someone found me. I, so I called my son and asked him, what the hell are you letting my grandson watch on TV? <laughs> right. And I told him what he said, and then he says that he told him the same story a few days ago, but chalked it up to having the smartest, most amazing kid with the biggest imagination <laughs> ever. I'm the grandma, of course, so I have to agree. I know that kids have imaginations, but it was the pooping on sticky paper that really makes me wonder. I've never watched a TV program that mentioned pooping on sticky paper. There were other details too much to list. But one of the reasons I'm bothered by this story is because I was camping in the same area the year before, and I woke up one morning face down in the dirt out of my tent and sleeping bag. I had a puncture wound in the back of my head. I'm a grandma in my 50s, so... I guess I'm a gra- I could be a grandpa, I guess. Mm-hmm. I'm a grandma in my 50s. I don't sleep in the dirt. I was violently ill, too sick to even pack and go home. I thought it was a spider bite. It took me a really long time to feel normal. I had no creativity, no emotions. My friend was camping with us. He was sleeping in his camper, and he also had a, quote, bite on the back of his neck and was violently ill. We were in separate sleeping areas. Before we went to bed, there were these weird red eyes shining through the trees in our flashlights. We thought it was a herd of deer trying to get to the river, so we didn't think too much about it. But now I wonder. My friend is checking into wildlife cameras. He wants to go and place them up around the campground. One weird thing about this place is that there were no wildlife. The only birds we saw were two crows. They flew in, sat in a tree, and watched us. I thought they were waiting for the Cheetos to fall in the dirt. At the time, we were creeped out by them. I camp a lot. Usually there are butterflies, birds, squirrels, etc. This time there was nothing. We didn't even see a bee. Oh, I forgot to mention during the Tom Messick case that one of the, I don't remember if he was the sheriff, the undersheriff, said when they went to the location, he said it was like freakishly quiet. Like there were no sounds of mm. anything. Yeah, that's odd. In which is woods? like a missing 411 thing. And that's yeah. kind of what she is saying right here too. My son has forbidden to ask my grandson about the incident because you can create a false memory by repetitive reminding. So for a year, I have not mentioned to him, but he was four and a half now, and I asked him again about what happened. He repeated the same story, except now he says she took him to a dungeon instead of a cave. So Hmm. it would be interesting to see if he has a memory of these events when he's about eight or nine years old. Um... Then she writes, I have been very bothered by a story, so I've been researching if there are others who have similar stories. I ran across an interview by the author of Missing 411, which discusses the weird disappearances in our natural forests. There are threads on ATS, above top secret, about Missing 411. In my reading about the national forests, I ran into discussions about the wilderness closing due to lack of funding and the Agenda 21 Wilderness Conservation Acts. There are other threads about Agenda 21 also. I think my question is, what is really going on in the national forests? Are they being closed off because there is a real threat living there? Are they being closed and corridored off limits to the public because something has taken over the woods? I wouldn't be questioning anything if our family would not have experienced unusual things in the forest. Somebody responded, you should ask him to do some drawings of the event. I know he is a kid. Maybe ask him to draw himself as well so you can compare how he draws humans to any other thing he might draw. And then she responds, Having him draw pictures is a great idea. I keep tons of art stuff for him. This happened on the McLeod River at the McLeod Campground. David Politis points out that there are two national forests young boys go missing from, and this is one of those forests. His account of going missing was in the McLeod newspaper. Not the story he told, just that he was lost. I think the only reason he came home to us is because hundreds of volunteers showed up in minutes and started to sweep the countryside. Whatever, or whoever, knew that they would be found and they ditched him quickly under a bush. Personally, I think we should organize the thousands of hunters that live up here and do a shoulder-to-shoulder walk through the woods, look in every cave, turn over every rock until we get to the bottom of this. I would definitely get involved if we did a national forest sweep, but I will never camp in this area again, not without the militia. Hmm. So then she writes again, My son actually collapsed. He ran up and down in every direction until he just collapsed and had to be carried back to camp. Looking for a I don't know. grandson? I'm, I'm, I'm trying sure. To figure, yes, yeah. I wasn't camping with him at the time, and I didn't know about it till a couple of days later, and I still fell apart and sobbed for about an hour. We are investing in a tracking device to clip onto his belt. I think every parent should have a locator chip, and I agree with that, that they can That's clip so onto true. their child when they're camping. And never take your eyes off them. An experience like this will certainly make you hyper vigilant. 
Uh, you are right. I think he is trying to tell what happened in terms that he understands or thinks we will understand. I don't want to bring it up to him and make a big deal about it again because I don't want him to have a false memory. But in a few months, I'm going to ask him about it and try to tape his response. I emailed the sheriff's office and told the officer his story. I'm sure they think I'm a wacko, but what if this matches someone else's story? I didn't include this in the first post, but when I asked him what the other grandma looked like, he insisted she looked just like me. In his words, quote, she had your same hair, your feet, and even your face. In his mind, he was taking a walk with me. Now that scares me deeply. When he talked about the light sparkling on her and she looked like a robot, I get the mental impression of a hologram, not a robot. I asked him what a robot is, and he says, quote, it's made out of metal and has a remote control. I don't know what to make of it. Somebody responds, Perhaps you blacked out from a night of heavy drinking. That or perhaps dementia or Alzheimer's. Maybe you were drugged in both our cases where you were victims of some corporation doing random experiments on people. That's far more believable than aliens. I don't think it is. That there's a corporation that's like kidnapping and testing stuff on people. I believe aliens more than I believe that. Mm -hmm. I find this story pretty far-fetched. I don't believe a word of it. Don't take it personally, but I don't know you and have no reason to take a stranger's claims as the truth. I smell BS on this. And then she writes, I have wondered if I did have a stroke that night. I've questioned Alzheimer's too. There were no drinking or drugs that night. I was gold panning for most of the day and wondered if I exposed myself somehow to mercury in the creek. I have found natural occurring mercury before, but I didn't see any in the pan on this trip. But it doesn't explain my friend with the same wound also being very ill. My grandson could have just gotten lost and made up a story, but he was only three when he told us this. I didn't write this post to get believers. I wrote it to see if there were other people with the same story and to let people know that we have experienced some strange things in the forest. I'm also wondering if any of this has anything to do with our national forest being closed due to lack of funding. I really hope you never experience anything like this. And then she writes again, the more I read about and experience the paranormal, the less I feel like I understand it. There are enough elements here to suggest something, quote, very not normal. And of course, there are thousands, millions even of other bizarre events like this, more or less. Physical, non-physical, alien, interdimensional, whatever, maybe we're getting all of the above. Maybe the fairies, gnomes, goblins, etc. of ancient lore are these same so sorts of timeless entities always managing to remain at the outer fringes of the human experience. And then somebody responded to that saying, well, I don't believe in gnomes or fairies. For some reason, the thing with the cave and the purses and guns bought the, bought the, brought this mental image of a storybook creature that pilfers people's camps while they are sleeping, stealing their purses and underwear and hiding them away like a leprechaun or something. <laughs> then then the lady, uh, the grandmother responds, we have never gone back to look for the cave. The only way I would feel safe doing that is if every ATS member or the militia or thousands of hunters were with me. It's been hard as a grandparent to figure out where the real experience is. On one hand, I can see him relating the experience to something he saw on TV and try to explain it from what he knew. Then the question is, did he fill in the gaps with his imagination? I just know something happened. I don't believe he could make, all up, make up all of these details either. So I believe he believes he experienced exactly what he tells me. I think the truth is that he was examined by something or someone. I don't know by who or what. I do know this. When I think about it, I get a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach, and that white, hot, shaky feeling overwhelms me. I think it's my intuition. I have tried to forget all about his story and file it away, but I feel very compelled to share it. I really think there's more going on in our national forest than we know about. Google missing 411. There's a scary amount of disappearances in our national forest. The reality of this is really disturbing. David Politis, the author of Missing 411, has a few interviews online. I have to work on learning to link them. My son and daughter-in-law have forbidden any conversation on the subject. They believe he just walked away from camp and made up a whopper of a story. But a few months ago, my grandson kept pestering his mom to go warn the neighbor that their tree was going to fall down. Of course, his mom assured him that the tree was not going to fall down, but three days later, the tree fell down. Wow. Yeah. That was something I'd never heard about this, that apparently he has like the shining now and knows huh. what's going to happen. Okay. Then he was at my house and I grabbed some leftovers out of the fridge to warm up and he began to scream, quote, no grandma, don't eat that. You're going to get sick. But I of course assured him that it was going to be okay. But oh my God, did I get sick? Last week he came over and told me to make sure everything stayed locked up because someone was going to break in and get all my stuff. Well, I decided to believe him this time. Everything is now locked up. So is he different? Is it maybe just a coincidence? He's my first and one. He's my first and only grandbaby, so I of course think he's special. 
and this is where I'm like, eh. I won't say too much about his bloodlines only because you never know who is reading this stuff, but I will tell you that he descends from 33 degree Freemasons on his mom's side. Hmm. So that kind of sets off my, uh, like when anybody starts going on about the Freemasons and all that stuff, I immediately am like, all right, you know, like I don't, yeah. I don't buy any of that stuff, hmm. you know, but this is interesting too. There's an old pioneer graveyard here that I have been involved with the genealogy research on for many years. There is a woman buried there named Maria Dursch. She was the last white woman killed by Indians in Shasta County. The Yahi Indians were accused of her murder and it caused the settlers to slaughter all the Yahi. The only survivors were Ishi, his two sisters, moms, and two braves. Ishi was the last wild Indian in America. I learned the day my grandson was born that he was Maria Dursch's three times great grandson. Also, the day he was born, an article came out in the newspaper all about Maria Dirsch, including pics of her headstone. Then in my research, I discovered he is born exactly 140 years, 40 years to the day of when the Masonic Lodge got its charter. All amazing coincidences. All of his grands for many generations are buried in the Masonic Cemetery. On my side, very old America, part native, lots of American history people. Also plugs into the royal lineages several times over on both sides. I just don't buy when you get into the... What does this have anything to do with any of it? Though? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> like, when, when they start talking Freemasons and all that stuff, I, I just... I feel like like my neighbor growing up was a Freemason. It's yeah. not like this... What no. does he think? He got We need to do an episode about Freemasons. Freemasons. We yeah, need to do we it because I don't think there's anything creepy about Freemasons. I yeah. just don't. It's your just post, a boys club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, she writes, your post brings up a huge reason of why I decided I had to speak up about these incidences. No one wants to believe that something terrifying is lurking in our national forest, but something very evil is taking them over. And in researching about this phenomenon, I discovered that huge chunks of our national forests are being closed off and limited to humans. These forests will be surrounded by a buffer zone, by buffer zone, like buffer zone reminds me, it's buffer night from our last uh, Phantom Diners episode. Oh, buffer night. Buffer night. This forest will be surrounded by a buffer zone and sections that connect the forest with each other. These corridors will also be off limits and they will be surrounded by a buffer zone. My question is, why are we being kept out of the national parks? Is there a connection between these closures and the missing people? Are they closing them down because they're dangerous? Has our government made a deal with different species of beings to live in the forest but stay out of the 25% of land that we will be allowed to live on when Agenda 21 is in place? Uh... I emailed David Politis about a month ago regarding the story that was told to me by my grandson. He requested an interview with my son and his wife, but they refused. Hmm. They feel it would be another nightmare for their son. I did document what my grandson told me with David Politis, so at least someone who is researching into this information has my information. Um, I actually really respect the parents for not wanting to yeah. traumatize their kid by yep. constantly revisiting it. <clears throat> She writes, thank you for all the advice and ideas. I will try to answer several of your posts at once. Number one, he has never been hospitalized, but that doesn't mean he didn't get a stool sample taken from a doctor at some other point. I'll ask my son about it. Number two, as far as a meth head, I would rather not think about what a tweaker would have done to him. I think I would rather think it was an alien or Bigfoot than think it was a tweaker. We do live in an area that is deeply afflicted with meth addicts, and they are sick. Somebody else writes, we do live in a place with huge natural gas reserves. I had not thought about that. Hmm. So maybe the sun was overwhelmed by gas fumes yeah. and dreamt this. Hallucinated. Number four, he wasn't questioned by the rescue responders. The hundreds, thousands of volunteer rescue people were just relieved that he was found. No one questioned if it was an abduction. They told me that he was told that the bush would be a, quote, good spot and that he should just wait there for help. The officers told my son that if he wouldn't have climbed under the bush, he probably would not have survived the ordeal. He very easily could have fallen into the river, gotten eaten by a wild animal. He was found over a mile up the trail. The trail he was on followed the McLeod River. It was past dark when he was located. The rescue team several times stated that they were amazed that he was smart enough to crawl under the bush. He was found by a canine unit. He said he thought the dog was an animal and he was going to get eaten when, when he heard his name being called. He said he jumped out of the bush screaming, here I am, here I am. <laughs> that part makes me very emotional even to type it. This happened on Labor Day weekend, 2011. Wow. He said the officer that found him said, put your head on my shoulder and hang on. He said the officer ran so fast down the trail. He also thought it was so cold, but the officer wrapped his arms around me and held me so tight I wasn't cold then. That's cute. Aww. Uh, number five, he goes to church with the other grandparents. I grew out of religion a long time ago. Number six, I have had bad neck problems for the last couple of years. I've had two MRIs and a CAT scan, but nothing has been found. They don't know why I'm having problems with my neck. 
Number seven, if I ever go back and look for the cave, I would start with the location where he was found and then fan out from that direction. He said he walked with her. So my opinion, I think they walked to where he was found to keep the scent and then up to a cave from there. Otherwise, the canine units wouldn't have found him. Hmm. Somebody else, and then she responds, it never occurred to us that he just may have been abducted. That was not on our mind at all. He was just, he was just playing on my porch with me, and out of the blue, he said, quote, I don't like the other Grandma Cappy. Nobody else was around, just the two of us. He didn't seem afraid. I asked him if he was scared, and he said he was scared when he went into the cave slash dungeon and when he saw the guns and purses, but he said over and over that the other Grandma Cappy was actually very nice. He thought it was me until the lights sparkled on her. It's weird. Yeah. And this, this is, I thought, I like this too, where somebody says, I'll ask my question once again. Do you think the child was trying to say persons with guns rather than purses purses? and guns? Hmm. They were, that he was trying to say persons, persons with guns. With like guns. there were people, like military people there. Yeah. And then she responded, he said the guns and purses were on a shelf and they were dirty. He axed things out and when he talked about the other robots, he pushed himself back and became stiff, frozen with a disoriented look on his face. My best description of this is the way that Han Solo looked like when he was in the Carbonite. Mm. Yeah, I'm picturing it. And him acting out the pooping part was hilarious. (laughs) He didn't mention any animals, skeletons, or any kind of skeletons or bones or smells. Hmm. Uh, and then people said, did this even really happen? And then she managed to find, like, the actual article from the paper is there. It was published September 6, 2011 on the Siski Sis, U Daily News article where it says, quote, A three-year-old boy who went missing Friday at a county campground was found cold and frightened but unharmed. According to a Siski U country sheriff, county sheriff's office press release the department responded to the report of a missing child at around 7 30 p.m friday the three-year-old boy had gone missing from fowler's camp located in the mcleod area in the vicinity of the mcleod river deputies from the sheriff's office were joined by the department's search and rescue unit as well as members from the california highway patrol the weed police department the eureka police department uh, mcleod volunteer fire department and the u.s forest service Law enforcement officials searched the campground and conducted an extensive grid search of the area. When a set of child-sized footprints were found along the shoreline of a creek in a heavily wooded area, a sheriff's office canine team was deployed to track the trail created by the person who left the footprints. The canine team located the boy at approximately 11.50 p.m. The child was cold and frightened, but overall he was in good condition. So the, it is actually, it did happen. I mean, there's an actual yeah, actual news story. Yeah. Uh, And then she wrote, just an FYI update for anyone still watching this thread. My grandson's story was shared on Coast to Coast AM in the latest David Polites interview. He didn't get the facts completely straight. I don't know if he was protecting her identity or if he didn't remember the details in the interview. I will be buying his latest Missing 411 book and see how the facts play out in the book. The interview is on the March 17th Coast to Coast program. Hmm. Also, I was asked about my son's, my grandson's blood type. He is A positive, but his mom is O positive. I think there is some kind of an O positive connection of Freemasonry and alien abduction. His mom is from a long line of 33 degree Freemasons. And then uh, I looked up and her last post, she was still posting as of 2020. So Grandma Cappy is still out there. Yeah. Uh, So now a couple Reddit comments about this from random people. Somebody writes, quote, I do believe what the child saw, he believes he saw. Whether it was a dream or reality, children that young tend not to lie because they don't have any concept of what a lie is and that it's wrong to do so. There's also Hmm. no incentive to lie. At least that's what I learned in psychology. It's possible he could have, but why? I think it's strange that the boy said he was in a cave and that there were dirty, dusty purses and rifles. To me, it sounds like that could tie into the missing hunters where their rifles and gear were never found. Mm. Like that's where they go. Yeah. And then somebody responds and says, I don't know. I've worked or interacted with a lot of children and this sounds exactly like th- something an imaginative three-year-old boy would, would say. The mixing of real details, grandma being lost, a cave full of purses, which to me sounds like a grandma's closet from a three-year-old's perspective with imaginative ones like a robot granny is very characteristic of that developmental stage. Three-year-olds have a different grasp on real versus pretend and passage of time than adults. Ask a child at that age what he did last week, and you might get, quote, I had grilled cheese and then went to the moon and played with a dog, and then I went to sleep for 100 years. It could have just been a dream, too. Yeah, a mix of fact and fiction. I mean, dreams are weird. Somebody else says, I have a a three-and-a-half-year-old right now who's very smart and advanced for his age. He he constantly confuses his dreams for actual events and will say Mm. things 
like and and say things just to say them because he likes being funny and creative. If he said anything even a tenth as outlandish as the summary you gave, I wouldn't assume it was true. Uh, somebody else writes, she's not a robot. She's a doppelganger who looks like his grandma. The robot quote was the boy's description on her doppelganger behavior. So somebody thinks she's a doppelganger. Mm-hmm. This is a response from a guy who worked search and rescue on this case. He says, uh, the mountain certainly does have quite a few legends surrounding it, but most places have a spot or two like that. As far as the young Mr. Doe goes, even putting aside any credibility questions about the anonymous grandmother, young kids are notoriously unreliable. I do search and rescue and once was a part of the rescue of a three-year-old kid who said he fought off a pack of wolves before we found him, then turned into that telling us that the wolves were actually robot versions of the dog who found him, (laughs) but he knew that she was trying to help because she was carrying a flower in her mouth and then licked him after she she gave it to him. Sure. She was my dog, and I can say with certainty that she did not bring him a flower. (laughs) All that in the 45 minutes or so we took to carry him out to a pickup spot and wait for the police and parents to arrive. Other things I learned around that time were that he had a dog himself that he regularly went up to heaven to visit and that Jesus may have helped him fight off the wolf pack, but he definitely saw Jesus who knew who he knew from visiting his dog in heaven. Kids that young have trouble telling tooth, truth from lies, especially in that kind of traumatic experience, and adults are very good at inadvertently encouraging that. The grandmother's account makes me think that she was looking for weird stuff to begin with, despite her denials of that, and kids do pick up on that. Her focus on the thing about the poop also sticks out to me. Almost all the toddlers and young kids I know love talking about poop and coming up with weird things about it. (laughs) Just the other day, I had a six-year-old tell me that I should start taping poop to my walls instead of paintings. Granted, my taste in art isn't exactly (laughs) highbrow, but I'm pretty sure he just thought taping poop to walls was a funny idea, rather than meaning it as a criticism of my decorating skills. Oh, funny. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I don't, uh, I I do like the idea that at that age, you're maybe too young to even understand what a dream is, but you know that it feels real and that you experienced it. And so maybe he fell asleep and had a dream. Yeah. Yep. And then somebody wrote this, which I thought was weird. We had a similar situation. At first, my sister told me about the incidents. She told me that sometimes my niece will be with them playing around and look into a dark area of the house like a hallway or room, start pointing and run to her mom and dad, telling them that there's an old lady in there that looks like a robot over where she was looking. She sometimes becomes so frightened she has a hard time speaking. I told them it's probably from a movie since you watch a lot of them, but they don't recall watching any movies where there's an old lady robot. Anyway, one time I was visiting and I was watching TV. Behind me was the kitchen with the lights off, of course. I'm holding my niece in my lap. When she looked at me, her eyes quickly shifted behind me. She started pointing and saying, Uncle, there's a robot lady behind you. I turned around and there was nobody there. I tell her there's nothing. She tells me, quote, she's standing in the kitchen right there. I proceed to go to the kitchen and tell her that there's nothing. I tell her how she looked and she says, quote, she, I asked her how she looked and she says, quote, she's old and looks like a robot. I quickly leave the room and go tell my sister about it. She stays with my niece until she forgets. It was their, it was their, this was their old home. They don't live in it anymore. In their new home, they've had no incidents, but I thought it was a weird tie in with your missing 411 story. That just feels like paranormal activity. That does, but <laughs> that feels, that's creepy to me. Uh, Somebody else writes, I had a dream once where I entered an underground chamber of some sort and there was an old lady there who told me to call her grandma. I was trying to get out of where I was and was really suspicious of the old woman. She ended up being a robot trying to kill me. And this was before I ever heard of the missing 411 story. Um, I don't recall ever having a dream about a robot. Somebody else writes, this past weekend I was staying at a hotel when I suddenly woke up to see a robot standing at the side of the bed full of wires. I was fully awake and panicked. I tried blinking to see if it would go away, and it didn't. I finally hid under the covers and reached for the lamp to turn it on. When I emerged, it was gone. Has anyone else experienced anything like this? It was not a lucid dream. So, I don't know. Hmm. The dream feels like a very plausible explanation, actually. The kid actually went missing because he wandered off. Yeah. Got tired, took a nap. Yeah. Had this dream. So that's all I could come up with on the deep dive is her actual accounts on 
the Reddit. above top secret forums oh, above, about yeah. it. One of the comments I read mentioned the kid's name, but I don't I don't know if it's the actual name, so I'm not going to say it yeah. because the kid wants, I'm assuming, wants nothing to do with people tracking him down and now bugging him about this. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to say it, but uh, I don't know. So that's that's what I could find about this. This this continuously shows up in the strangest missing four one one stories, mm-hmm. and it's just. I mean, do you think it's? Do you think I start to lean more towards he fell asleep and he dreamed the whole all that weird stuff? Yeah, it's completely plausible, completely. And at that age, not being old enough to even understand that a dream isn't real. Yeah, you know what I mean. And thinking that actually happened. Some of the stuff is weird to me, though. Like the pooping on sticky paper is like a weird. Dreams are weird, man. And and <laughs> the robot grandma saying that he was put in his mom's tummy by an alien. You know, is this is this something? Are they watching like movies with kids being abducted, where people being abducted by aliens, and that's where he gets this idea from? I feel like even something you hear in passing that you're not consciously paying attention to can show up in your dream. Yeah. So I don't think it even has to mean that they sat down and watched a movie about this stuff. He could have been out in a restaurant with his family and the people at the next table were having yeah. a conversation about something that he just picked up on and yeah. dreamed about later. You but know what I mean? There are weird missing 411 stories about the, the, was it a bear bringing berries to one of the kids that, yeah, you know, so I want to believe that this actually happened because that makes it really interesting. Yes. But I just don't i guess it also could have been someone tried abducting him brought him to some shack yeah and then he realized that they were looking that they were searching for him so he sent him back he t- brought the key put the kid under the bush and said wait here somebody will be coming back to yeah get you. and there's his three-year-old mind yeah. could only put together what his strange imagination came up with you know what i mean yeah so are you leaning towards this actually happened or no I'm I'm leaning towards it. It didn't actually happen. I'm that there was it no was a dream. There was no robot grandma. As yeah. cool and as creepy and as weird as that story is, yeah, I lean towards there's no weird robot slash hologram grandma in a agreed in a cave full of purses. I, he obviously went missing. Yeah, that happened. Yeah, but but on the other hand, and this was a weird synchronicity, is that Mount Shasta is supposed to have something mm. inside of it. That I wanted, I'm like, I'm going to do an episode about Mount Shasta. And then Haunted Objects podcast just did an episode about Mount Shasta. Yes. So that was I a didn't weird finish synchronicity. That yet, so no spoiler alerts. I won't. But it's like, I want, I like, Mount we'll Shasta is supposed to have some race that lives inside of it. And it's weird that well, this was. Well, it's just a liminal space, as yeah, they call it. Yeah, but it's it. weird that this was kind of that same area. Uh-huh. But I am, my meter is leaning on this didn't actually happen. It's yeah. just an overactive imagination that got blown up into a, a missing 411 strange. And it story. feels like Grandma really wants it to be significant. And yeah, wants when she started there going into the thirty, the, the, the Mas- yeah, when they started going into that, it's like, uh, what does that have anything? But I to kind do of agree it? with what the guy said, where maybe she was kept prodding him about. So what else was weird about mm-hmm. there? Like, even though she claimed she didn't, he's like, sometimes Grandma you, wants more weird stuff. Yeah, sometimes I'm you make want some that, stuff even though you're not realizing, you're kind of feeding that to right. the kids. So I lean towards this never happened. Yep, I agree. Oh well, there you go. Two we, missing four one one deep on a dive. Missing four one one. Yeah, we did. Have we ever done that before? I was going to read this one. That's kind of like a guy just ripping on David Politis about how his. He basically starts saying, "I'll just say that as a search and vo- search and rescue volunteer, David Politis is full of bleep." Mm-hmm. You know, so I was going to read that, but I'm, what time are we looking at? Uh, an hour and fifty. Yeah, I don't want to get into. It's probably more like you know, yeah. An hour and forty because yeah. of all the unedited. Like I said, stuff there, there was that one. There was there was something with a missing four and one thing where I was researching it, and somebody said you should check out the Strange Sessions podcast about missing four. That's crazy. So I don't want to crap on David Politis because he probably listens to us. <laughs> I doubt that. You know, well, I, I bet you a lot of people. <laughs> Stranger things have happened. Yeah, a lot of people find us because of missing four and one mm-hmm, for sure. Do I think he's full of crap? No, I don't. I think that he. You know, and so many people accuse him of cherry picking stories. And I'm like, that's exactly what he's doing is because he wants to find stories that have some kind of weird element to them that fit into the missing 411 yeah, stuff. You have to cherry pick. I think that even even if... Is he potentially cashing in on these tragedies, maybe? I, but he's also bringing light to these yes, missing people. And I think this is super important. The families probably don't care. They just yeah. want the story A to A lot of people accuse on. him of tweaking the facts to fit his... Mm. his details interesting you know which i i i like david politis i'm not i'm not his missing four-on-one subreddit is just people constantly 
dissing him mm-hmm. that that he's a fraud and he's a huckster and all that. Yeah. And I don't. I think even if even if one or two of the stories that we've talked about in the missing four and one episodes are true, there's something weird going on. Yeah, for sure. You know, do I think it's this big conspiracy thing? Maybe not, but I think there's something to these. Yeah. A lot of these disappearances. You know, like the Trini Gibson one, I totally think it was foul play. I totally think yeah. one of the other school kids killed her. I really do. But it's still a fascinating story. And her being in the missing four on one stuff keeps bringing attention that her family may someday get closure. closure. So yeah. no, I I totally, I have no ill feelings towards David Plotis. No, I, don't I just either. don't. I love his books. I love Stephanie, our listener, who bought his books for us. We're endlessly fascinated. We're endlessly, yes. Yeah. So I, I don't think he's a huckster. I don't think he's a fraud. Um, I, I just don't, I'm just going to say that. Yeah. And that's all I got for this one. Okay. Dangs. What, do you guys like the missing four in one spotlights? I'm I hoping feel like you guys the do. answers are over- overwhelmingly. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Song choices for this week. This is kind of a twofer. And I think I did the first one before, but I stumbled across this video once on YouTube and I don't even know how I stumbled across it because it doesn't even have that many views. I'm pretty sure I did this one already. I'll just start by saying it's the song No Light Left by the band Snow Fight in the City Center. Hey, I love the name Snow Fight in the City Center. <laughs> I think that's such a cool name. But I loved this song, and it's one of my go-to songs that I go listen to quite a bit. Um, it's just, it's like a like a Coldplay kind mm. of song. It's got this little keyboard part or little piano part that I love in the song. But it's just a really good song. It's called No Light Left by Snow Fight in the City Center. There's hardly any comments on it because nobody even really knows this song is out there. So somebody wrote, saw this band live years ago. It's a shame they faded. They are amazing live. And then somebody else writes, bad news. This band is no more. But the good news is they evolved into the band Delphic, possibly the best indie dance band in the UK today. Yay. So then I looked that up and they did turn into a band called Delphic that are like a like a dance keyboard pop band, but they have a song that I love. And my second song choice for this week is the song Counterpoint by Delphic. And it's just weird that it's the same band because mm-hmm. this new that one is, is funny. Like, yeah. So somebody writes. So they just changed the name and maybe and became the more, style make, of their music. Yeah, they changed the name and style of your music, but, but I love this song Counterpoint. Somebody writes in, underneath it in YouTube. If one of the members of Delphic ever reads this, this is one of the most impressive songs of the decade, and I hope you are as proud to have made it as I am to share it with people who have never heard it. Somebody else comments, such an underrated song. Somebody else writes, what a track. I keep coming back to this because it's just so very special to me. Then somebody else writes, quote, ran into a pub with my best friend in Leeds to pee after God knows how many loggers way back down in 2009. Ran into this band playing this song live. Arms were up in the air. The smoke was rising. The floor was sticky and there were lights flashing everywhere. Just text her saying it's been 13 years. Where did that gorgeous decade go? I like that. I think that's like a super sweet comment, mm-hmm. but it's just like a really good song. Like I love this song. So my song choice, number one, no light left by snow fight in the city center and song choice. Number two, Delphic, the band that snow fight in the city center turned into the song counterpoint. Those will both be posted in the group. Sweet. And our question given to us because our listeners haven't sent any, our question asked by chat GPT, <laughs> How has our understanding of the paranormal changed over time? Oh, that's kind of a good question, it actually. Is. Like when I got that, huh. I was thinking about that. And I'm like, dang. Uh, I think I've become much more open to the possibility of alternate explanations, meaning yes. um, I used to just think EVPs were ghosts who were in the room with me talking. Yeah. 100. Now I, I believe it could be a parallel universe or alternate dimension and things are bleeding over like stuff like that. I used to, when I started getting into this, I thought it was very cut and dried. Ghosts were ghosts. Bigfoot was Bigfoot. Yep. And now I'm starting to think that all of these things, like, like when we talked about John Keel, like, like his theory, like all of these are intertwined. It's Mm -hmm. all part of the same big picture. And we just don't know what that big picture is. And that big picture might not want us to know what it is. It just keeps messing with us. Like, I love that idea. Yeah. I love the idea that my opinion on ghosts might have changed from dead people that passed on to some weird time glitch or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think ours has changed 
definitely since we started this it's podcast expanded for and sure. looking into it and synchronicities have yeah, become yeah. this huge have become thing. a huge thing speaking of i i ran across um across on youtube there is a panel that the hellier group did um it was like an hour long it's really interesting if you if you come across that i think it might be on their their uh, planet weird channel but um john tenney is interviewing them about season one of hellier and it's so interesting and it um greg at some point talks about how all of these things are are part of a bigger thing so what you just said reminded me of something yeah because they're very keel yes i can't can't remember what the name is like keel like these it's you know, they always call it like a trickster figure or mm-hmm. it's it's one thing just constantly messing with us because it's think it's it thinks it's funny. Mm-hmm. You know? And I, I kind of tend to believe ever since we did the John Keel episode, I've come very much to believe in what Keel says is that we can search all we want, we're not gonna find an answer. Right. You know, the That's answer the, fun of it, the answer is in the searching. Isn't that the fun it of is, it? It is it is the fun of it. So there you go. Thank you, ChatGPT, for yeah. that interesting question. We can always rely well, on that. Originally, when I questions. saw that, I didn't know if it meant how is our, because I said ask a question for our podcast we do, or collectively. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it, collectively, the understanding the paranormal has changed yeah. because your idea of the paranormal kind of reflects what the beliefs of the time are. Mm-hmm. You know, well, like when, way, yeah. when you think back to, you know, like I think it's become more esoteric where it's more like time slips and time glitches now where it didn't used to be but i think it changes i think people's ideas of the paranormal changes with the times yeah you know like i think it changed a lot from the days of the mediums sure in like the 1800s and stuff like that that yeah. it's changed a lot so the i thought that was an interesting tipping. question yeah very interesting Ooh, is there anything else um i would just mention season three of the witcher has started on okay. netflix it's so good yep i'm trying not to binge the crap out of it because i think it's only five episodes long i'm almost done today i'm going to finish friday night lights which mm. is just such an amazing show like if you never watched it watch it i absolutely love what they did in season four of the show to mix it up i think mm. that was one of the most brilliant things i've ever seen but it's a good show but it it it, it kind of fell into my felicity curse where the first season is just brilliant Mm -hmm. then after that it gets like kind of soap opera-y and dumb Mm -hmm. and it's like yeah that's don't do that storyline that's dumb but the first season is just so good so it's very much felicity like for me like i said the first first season of felicity is just perfection Hmm. it was still good after that but it just kind of fell into the typical 90210 Dawson's oh, Creek tropes where yeah. you know like that kind Love of stuff. triangles yeah. whatever so I don't know what I'm going to watch next I'm probably going to get rid of Netflix once I'm done with mm. uh, Friday Night Lights because I don't have the money for it but Tubi and Pluto TV I got plenty to watch and YouTube there's a lot of stuff you can watch on YouTube even oh, yeah. movies and TV shows yeah or maybe get out and actually do things instead of sitting in front of my TV. Oh, right. Which would also if it be weren't nice. so hot. Kristen and I might be getting out a little bit this week there's yep. a little spoiler for next episode Yes. I'm excited about that one. That should be... Me too. Maybe possibly having a new guest co-host that's never been here before. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting. I want to get Brittany on sometimes, maybe in fall. Because sure. Brittany's the only Zon that hasn't been on, and I asked her what she would want to come on and talk about, so she's going to kind of think. But that's all I got. Cool. Is it time for the side sessions? It is si- time for the side sessions. Do you even know what it's about? No, because you showed up today and you were like, are we doing a side session today? So <laughs> It's a product. Okay. A drinkable product. Oh, we'll just say that. Okay. Um, it's not very long, so it's going to be a short side session. That's cool. Uh, when air, when somebody's here next time, <laughs> we're going to have a we'll a come we'll come up with a que- like a top five favorite things. Oh, and yeah. Because then because they, they can participate because they love food. It's going to oh, be good. food related, so I'm going to try to come up with a topic for that. Sweet. Do so you want to go over our deets? Oh, our deets. I suppose we got to give those out. Uh, you can email us at thestrangesessions at gmail.com. We are on Twitter, I think, at Strange Session without the final S. We are on Instagram where Krista does an amazing job. We love our Instagram listeners. Love you guys. I feel like I give so much love to the Facebook. strangers Facebook yeah. group, but not enough to the Instagram people who are absolutely freaking amazing. Love you guys. You can send us postcards and snail mail to the Strange Sessions, P.O. Box 434, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, 54221-0434. You can call our lonely phone line. Nobody's called there in forever. 920-443-9602. 
and you can send listener stories if you would like to the strange session stories at gmail.com that I have not checked since I created it. So I probably need to go check. I always say that. And then I always forget. And I think that is it. I should add that Gmail to my phone. Yeah. Cause I get notifications for every, everything else. Yeah. Yep. At least one of us would be checking it. it when are we doing this. a listener story episode at the end of the season? Towards the end of the season. Okay. But, um, it's July already, so... Uh... It's July already. Yeah, we're like halfway through the season already, I think. <sighs> like almost halfway through the season already. Mm-hmm. We did start a little late this year just due we to did. crazy stuff going on. But yeah, but... near the end, maybe like when I start school again, when I have crazy stress and I don't have time, that's always a good time for... Listening but then I also want to do like I'm saving all these creepy Reddit stories yes. that I read, so I want to do another stories episode. Uh, yeah, so we got the rest of the season has fallen in place. I think we might have enough for one more season in us. We're going to see. <laughs> think of all the strange states we have oh to my get God. through. We, we could do a whole, we could do two seasons just doing strange states alone. We could do more than two seasons yeah. just doing strange states. We're not, we're not calling it quits anytime soon that I know of, but we'll figure it out. Uh, it would be so like, I always, it's morbid to think about, but it's always like, what if I died? Oh my God. I know. I shouldn't think about that, but like, like, like what would happen if we had an episode that we didn't release yet and I died? It's like, would you, would you release I would it? have to release Like, would you go it. on there and be like, hey, listeners, just letting you know what happened? Like, yeah. <laughs> those are, those are, That's those horrifying are my 2 a.m. thoughts. About. Those are my 2 a.m. thoughts. I think I would have would... Corey join me to yes. do that. Yeah. That would be so hard. Why are for Corey, we talking though. about I don't know. This? Those are those are my two a.m. thoughts when oh I'm having God. a bad bad morning and I'm laying in bed thinking about stuff. Okay, eat less hot dogs and more vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got maybe veggie dogs. Oh, there you go. You know, uh, even those are probably bad for you. They probably are. Yeah, some I vegans will turn bad. carrots I into eat hot so dogs. Bad, like I shouldn't because I'm pushing fifty three. I'll be fifty three in two weeks. You know, I shouldn't be living on ramen noodles and hot probably dogs. Probably not. Ugh. Sneak a veggie in there. Yeah. You should be getting your vitamins from your food too, not from a bottle. Not just from a multivitamin. Yeah. Yeah. It's the alive multivitamin. It has like food stuff uh-huh. in there, like pieces of food, like sure, bananas sure, sure. and spinach. Mm-hmm. So yeah, maybe I'd feel better if I ate a I think banana probably. once in a while. Yeah. Air, well, maybe some leafy greens. Dark when leafy I was somewhere greens. yesterday with. You know who. You know who. He, there, who there's must actually not be a named. cafe there, which is really nice. Hmm. And he bought smoothies for him and I with bananas like Ooh. in them and I'm like oh my god that was so good I gotta go back to smoothies like I love my breakfast smoothies with spinach and blueberry there you go but good I antioxidants just, once I get money coming back in so anyway that's enough about that we went on a little tangent yeah there. we did a little so thank you guys so much for listening we love you guys more than you know we like do. it amazes me that we've been doing this for so long and we have never flaked never once flaked nope. we keep doing it what we say we're going to get together, we get together. So it just floors me how long we've been. Like uh, yesterday, I stopped at the school. Yeah, pee. you sent me a picture. Like whenever I go down to see you know who, I, st- I take that way through Batavia and I stop at the school and it's just so cool going in there. But I'm like, my God, this was a long drive. You to must go to be the lucky that because the cadets still go there. I was yeah, just it was, talking it was to like Jeff a and Thursday, Joe. It was a Friday morning at like oh, they probably were only nine there on a.m. The there was nobody. Yeah. There might have been the lights were on in the hallway. The motion sensor lights were somebody on in the hallway, so somebody there. might have been in there. But I just went in to pee in the bathroom and and left. But it's just like that was such a long drive. I mm-hmm. preferred doing it here. Yeah, but it was cool doing it there For because it could be reasons. spooky. It could mm-hmm. be spooky, and we don't want it to be spooky here. You know? No, no, not at all. No. <laughs> so. Thank you guys, especially you guys that have been here from the start. Holy crap, we especially love you guys. Especially considering like how much stuff we forget to do or yeah, how, things how, we say we're going to do that we how, never do. Like How unprofessional we are. Oh my gosh. You know, that we don't go out and be like, like and subscribe. Hey, so, you know, get value. our name out there. Like, get our name out there. We just oh do what gosh. we do and we just love that you yeah, guys... Yeah, hey, you guys want to like and subscribe us somewhere? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. <laughs> so especially sticking us with... I feel like we always just talk about the same old crap, but yet so many of you guys... I know. Love listening to us, and you have no idea how much that means to us. So yeah. truly, we truly the fact love that you. we're someone's feel good show yeah. feels really good. Yeah. We truly love you guys. So thank you so much for listening. And now to the side sessions. And until next time, stay, stay strange. strange.